The game between Li Xiao and Henriquez is, is interesting. We have this knight versus bishop in balance. White's got pressure on things like g6 and e6. The problem is, whoa, is he sacking? He did it. I was going to say, I was just about to say the problem is you can't do anything about it right now. Well, he just proved me wrong. Snap. Whoa. Wait, so what if you just take Look at <laughs> Li Xiao is also like, what? <laughs> I don't think he believes it either. F5, and he's like, uh... He moved his king away. But at first, that looked like... <laughs> you know what that looked like, Danny? What? It looked like an oh bleep moment. Yeah, it looked like a, like, oh, did I just miss that? Right, and then it's like, a, oh, wait a second. That's not that bad. This actually works out for me. <laughs> he's like, all right, what? You're not Anna Rudolph. Nope. My name is Robert Hess. I wanted to be like, this is not heaven. <laughs> Did you ever? I mean, he heaven can wait. <laughs> heaven can wait. You know what can't wait? The Pacific Division of the 2019 Pro Chess League quarterfinals. We are in the playoffs. The one, the only Grandmaster Robert Hess jumps in to bring the energy for the final three hours. Robert, break it down for me, babe. Tell us how the Minnesota Blizzard can pull off what is an upset in many people's eyes despite them actually having draw odds in the overall one seed. Yeah, it's funny because they have such a balanced lineup that people underestimate them because they don't have the heavyweights like Li Chao, Wang Yiwei. But I think that if they can p pile up the victories on board four against Shangdu's board four, that's four possible points there. I know Shangdu's board four went two and a half of four last week, but this is a new day. It's a new week. And while well, they're playing for their season to make the playoffs. Yep. Well, and I guess to be fair, a storyline I would highlight is uh, the Shangdu Pandas are, are a heavyweight normally featuring a couple of 2750 pluses that rotate on board one. They don't have that today. Now, we know Li Chao is a very, very strong grandmaster and actually the manager, for those who don't know, the manager and, and the founder of the Shangdu Pandas. So uh, that's uh, it, it's nice to see him putting it all on the line here to try to help his team get back to San Francisco. But they're not sporting Yu Yang Yi or Ding Li Ren on board one today, Robert. Do you think that changes things a little bit in regards to how uh, Minnesota is expected to do in this match? Yeah, it's a little unclear because I always think that Minnesota, I mean, they're so balanced. And I see people in the chat saying, oh, they're still the underdogs, this and that. I mean, they have draw odds, but I just think that the players for Chung, I mean, it's not even... I don't think you can argue the point. The top three boards for Shangdu are just stronger yeah. than the top three boards for Minnesota, right? Li Chao is obviously stronger than Fidel Corrales. 
Wang Yue is stronger than Chris Abel Enriquez. Uh, Zhao Jun, okay, Andrew Tang, I know he's a, you know, especially a bullet legend, but this is rapid chess. And so I got to give the nod to Zhao Jun on that board as well. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, worth stuff. And you, you said last week that one of the lineups that kind of poses problems for Minnesota is this sort of very uh, top heavy lineup, right? They have a very well balanced approach and they're going to rely on everybody kind of beating up on Zong Di, I think the board four for Shang Du, to make up for the fact that they have three very strong grandmasters, as you said, boards one through three. Uh, you know who's super strong in the Twitch chat today is uh, Avram. I missed it earlier. I, I missed the numbers in his name, but he's been, Avram 4-2 has been been dropping subs like they're like they're hot potatoes, and we really appreciate it. Shout out to Cash Menk, who just subscribed there. Um, shout out to everybody that's with us. If you're just tuning in for some reason, you missed a super exciting Atlantic division. Let me remind you of what just went down. The St. Louis Archbishops barely got by the Webster Windmills. Uh, it was a, a very... Uh, kind of heartbreaking way for that match to come to a close because it was a one-point difference heading into the final uh, set of games, Robert, and Ilya Nizhnik was on pace to just do what he's supposed to do and, and beat Nicholas Thurdo after a blunder in the Nightorf, and then he trapped his queen in, in kind of a super uh, uh, obscure, kind of instructive, puzzle rush fashion. Uh, were you watching? Uh, no. Okay. Should I have been? Well, that just that just totally took the wind out of my sails. Well, that's why I'm, you know, I take your breath away. So wind, breath, uh, sorry. Hey, I got nothing else the, the windmills are no longer with us. You don't need to be talking about blowing stuff, okay? You need to talk about well, chess right now. <laughs> this, this isn't many a rook end game, Dan. I don't know what you're talking about. What I, what <laughs> you know I want, exactly what what I want you to do right now <laughs> is bring positive energy. Do you even know how to give a compliment on this show to me? Uh, yeah, I do. Danny, you look great. I was watching you a little bit earlier. I'm going to be honest with you. I was watching. <laughs> oh, you were like, watching. Uh, yeah, but earlier, earlier. Okay. I mean, then I had okay. to eat dinner and <laughs> all that stuff. But you did a great job with Anna. I'm proud of you. You won that French match. I got to give you the props there. Which is, so, look, we're all shocked about that. Let me say we're all a little disappointed that I won that match. All right. I'm with you on that one. Um, but I don't know what you guys are talking about. This is just me and Robert talking about, um, Taking taking each other's breath away and uh, and uh, helping um, helping our team to victory because we have a collective team here, the Chess.com team. Yep, we do. And I, it's funny. I was just looking at the chat and I, I'm trying to be objective about the kind of how I see this matchup going. And I think Minnesota obviously has a chance. Right? They need eight points. A anyway, draw is a win for them. But I'm trying to figure out where they're going to get their eight points mm -hmm. because. This top-heavy lineup with an underrated board four, at least he appears to be underrated based on the result last week, um, I just I don't know how they're going to total eight points. They need to do something like two and a half, two and a half. You know, I just, I'm, just, I'm trying to add it here in my head, and it's like it's just not happening. Yeah. I just don't see how they get, get two and a half, two and a half, two one or something like that. It's just I don't see that combination of results happening just because Strong Do is stronger in those top three boards. Uh, it's it's uh it's a great point and and honestly again I'm I'm with you I think the biggest nod we have to give to Minnesota is they have been probably about as hot as any team heading into the playoffs right so if momentum and if you know playing well at the right time of the season matters there is that going for them and they also have draw odds right which gives you it gives you kind of that miracle territory too right if you get one game to go your way that wasn't supposed to you save a half point there they get by on a draw and I think that um. You know, while they're they're not going to be playing for that psychologically, you can't play for a draw in every game. But if the match somehow comes down to to a couple of critical moments, that's where you, that's where upsets can happen. And again, um, we are uh, ready. I, if, if we're ready for a few things here, but the biggest thing we're ready for is actually for somebody to be joining us who actually hasn't been on one of these shows in quite some time but he looks so good and one of my one of my <laughs> best one of my best friends who people don't even you know what Hondi, you want to tell people how close we are how close are we I know that's embarrassing you can't say that in public it's embarrassing <laughs> to talk about what we've been through in public but we'll um what we'll, we'll keep it on right now is 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 the bishops right the archbishops who 
Uh, well, I guess in many people's eyes, they did what they were supposed to do when you have Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So. A lot of people look at that as uh, the, the strongest one-two punch in the league. But you know you know as well as anybody, it was a full-team effort. Nicholas Thurdu coming, coming through with uh, with that huge combination against Ilya Nizhnik, um, really to kind of clinch the match. And as somebody who lives in St. Louis, you're involved in, in a lot of things at the club. Um, how excited is the club and kind of the local environment there about the success of the Archbishops in the Pro Chess League? Well, I, as you know, the St. Louis Chess Club has a million projects right now. We're in the middle of the U.S. Championship and actually kind of taking a break happens to be on the Pro Chess League day. So it worked very well for us. But even then, we're very excited about the Pro Chess League. I know Mike Hummer, our manager, is incredibly excited, but it goes all the way up. Rexing feels very happy. Uh, Joy Bray is always looking at those games. Do you think that they never pay attention, but they really do. They actually see all of the chess that St. Louis is involved with. And well, I'm very happy with our performance today. Very excited that uh, the Archbishops get to go back to San Francisco, try to win again, as we did in 2017. And we had some huge results. I mean, Nico scored three out of four. That's just huge. Yeah, yeah, he did. And and what do you what do you? Th- I, I don't know if we were allowed to share it, but what do you expect the lineup to be in in um in San Francisco? Right. We know, as you said, it's uh, the St. Louis Chess Club is is very busy. Uh, but so are a lot of the endeavors they're involved in with the Grand Chess Tour and and a lot of the tournaments that these top players are are competing in. But um, first of all, will you be in San Francisco? You were there last year, and uh, who do you expect uh, to be able to to make it there to the Bay Area? Mm, that's a great question, actually, because we are unfortunately, I think that we are not able to send our one-two punch. I think that Fabiano is going to be available, but I believe that Wesley has a commitment with the Abidjan. Uh, Ivory Coast Grand Chess Tour event. So unless he's flying directly from San Francisco <laughs> to Ivory Coast with the day there in between and manages to make it, I have a feeling <laughs> that we're not going to have him. Uh, so I actually have no idea what the lineup is. My camera, you know, is probably already uh, strategizing and thinking about the 20,000 lineups we have, but it'll be a mystery. Right now, even I don't know if I'm going. Well, Alejandro, I have a quick question for you. You know, you see this matchup between Minnesota and Chengdu. As a team that's already qualified for the Final Four um, playoff there, which team do you root for? Which do you think your team stacks up best against between the Chengdu Pandas and the Minnesota Blizzard? Mm, I think if I had to pick a team that I want to face, I would rather face Minnesota than Chengdu. I think Chengdu is really stacked. And their board four, to me, is always a mystery. Sometimes they just play so well on board four. They kind of try the same lineup that we do. But especially since we're going to miss Wesley, I really don't want to have a lineup facing, you know, three, almost 2,700 GMs uh, with a very dengerous young fourth board. I think Chengdu is always a favorite in this kind of situations. And, well, I'm rooting for Minnesota because I have some friends there. Like Johnny B is right now playing as Lee Chow. Johnny B has been my friend for years, one of the first people I met in America. So I'm definitely rooting for them. But I also think they're the easier pairing uh, ones in San Francisco. Makes sense to me. The the comments that some of the players gave when we asked them, uh, Alejandro, about, about who they thought their biggest rival was, there was a common sentiment from those from Webster looking at the at the St. Louis Archbishops. Pretty much every one of them said that you guys were their biggest rival and uh, even some pretty transparent comments about about um, about how much they would really like to beat the club. And the club was a little bit, a lot of the players on the other side were like, oh, we don't really have a rival. We kind of, you know, we kind of got to do our own thing. Like, what's the sentiment there in St. Louis? Is there is there like any kind of crosstown rivalry? I'm going for like a Yankees-Mets thing here, like Yankees-Red Sox. Is there is there any bad blood building given that this is the second time that the Bishops have eliminated the, the windmills via uh, in the playoffs? Well, I think that when you have such chess powerhouses next to each other, it's inevitable that we become kind of rivals in some ways. Of course, there are collegiate rivals because a lot of the uh, St. Louis Chess Club slash Archbishops team is comprised of uh, St. Louis University students. And they have the upper hand against us there. They've beaten us pretty much every time that we've played so far, even though it's not that been that many times. So it goes back and forth, not only the Pro Chess League, but also in Collegiate Chess. It makes a lot of sense that we're kind of a rivalry at the moment, but I'm kind of happy that at least in the Pro Chess League side, we're kind of dominating them, yeah. not only <laughs> in the playoff se- season, but also in the regular seasons. Yeah. 
Well, um, Alejandro, this is this has been great to catch up. And and if if the bishops don't have their uh, their one two punch, maybe there's a certain little peasant who wants to fill in on one of the boards and and compete for for his team. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Little Peasant, one of the most legendary online chess players of all time. And we're talking to him. They didn't even know they were talking to a legend right now. Well, I have to dust off some chess pieces because I've been doing a lot of commentary. I've been doing a lot of coaching, traveling around the world. But I haven't been playing a lot. I think I have to get back into it if uh, the team needs me. But I hope to pull through and hopefully go to San Francisco. And this time you'll have more stable internet because everybody saw your last round game <laughs> at the Miami Champions. Not to... Uh, Open fresh wounds over we there. Gonna, we I mean, gonna, I was so upset. We don't need to remind so him of that. The, the archbishops are winning. We don't need to remind him that the last time he was on camera here, we, we lost him on Zoom and he lost the game. But okay, the fans, obviously, there's been a lot of hype for you guys in the chat. A lot of uh, St. Louis Archbishop emotes. So you guys have a ton of support, both in St. Louis and outside of it, Alejandro. And congratulations as somebody who's involved there. And uh, we hope to see you in San Francisco. We're going we're gonna to move on to this uh, Xiangdu versus Minnesota match. Well, thank you, guys. I'm going to go downstairs and watch on my TV, so carry on. See you, man. Right. Thanks, Alondra. And there you have it. And there we have a uh, – <laughs> I thought we had a live panda on screen there for a minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was he was, he was was looking uh, looking kind of scary there. Um, but I believe that is the manager and grandmaster, Lee Chow, someone who conversed with many <laughs> times as, uh, as the leader of the free panda world there in Chengdu. Um, and uh, – he actually puts in a ton of work. Li Chao, Li Chao is honestly an amazing ambassador for chess in China overall. For those of you who don't know, he, he's uh, greatly involved in a lot of their ch chess clubs, a lot of their uh, scholastic movements, helping helping the youth players of tomorrow, and probably something that actually has helped him build this team, Robert, given that he is the manager. He is the guy that found Zhang Di as that underrated Chinese league player who's playing on board four tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, of course, in addition to being a great manager, he's obviously an amazing player rated above 2,700. And he's been doing some head scratching physically, but also he raised his eyebrow at this last move, Bishop F4. He was not expecting that move um, that John Bartholomew just played. And I assume it's because he thought that JB would have put, tried to put a knight on B6. So he could have taken that knight on F6 rather than retreating with his bishop. And instead he retreated his bishop and he's now contemplating, you know, what, what could have been. Because that knight was going right into the b6 square, it ties black up. And... Well, and he's probably calculating, as you said, I mean, does he want to eliminate that knight, right? And eliminate a very typical kind of, but yeah, he does it. But no any idea for white, which is to play a5, put a knight on b6 here. So he doesn't have to be asked twice to, to stop Bartholomew from taking that plan. And, and now he's just played b6. I, I'm, I'm liking black actually a little bit more now. Yeah, absolutely. I still think that white has a good position because that pawn on B B6 is a backwards pawn. You can put a rook on B1 at some point, which is why I was going to recommend the bishop to F5, just stopping that rook from getting to that square. Um, but now you can, as white, you have two options that I really consider here. One is to immediately put some pressure on the B6 pawn. I don't think you get much out of it. The other is to play bishop D3 and play pawn to C4 to lock up that queen side, cement that pawn on B6 in its place, and then even switch gears to the king side. And note, everybody, that bishop d3, knight takes d5 is not a possibility due to bishop takes h7 check, uh, followed by, followed by. in fact, Bartholomew goes for it, so we're going to see that tactic again, followed by the queen taking on d5. So, yeah, I like that idea, Robert. The pawn on c4 not only will, as you said, cement the b6 pawn, but also overprotect d5, and, and then we go back to rook b1. Ooh, but Li Chao's not going to sit around and, and, uh, and wait, right? He's going to try to change the structure before it's too late. Yeah, and maybe it's impatience. Maybe it's just a good time to break out here because I think white can just claim a solid advantage. C takes B5. And after C takes B5, I assume he's going to go take on D5 with the bishop because if you take with the knight on D5, you're going to run some tactical problems with B takes A6. So he will take back on D5 with that bishop there. And, well, I mean, to me, it looks like white is just better in a position where you can even go take that pawn on A6 and you're the one with an outside pass pawn. And so even if you lose this a6 pawn, to me, white has the a, other a pawn to use. The d6 pawn is a weakness. You have the two bishops advantage. So to me, it looks like John Bartholomew is off to a great start. Okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. I, I guess I'm a little bit more dynamically biased toward the fact that the d5 pawn was lost means that black had a successful Bononi-ish position. But it's instructive to hear you talk about that. In fact, that here in this case with the bishop pair and the queen side falling apart, that normally white losing the center in this way in a Bononi is just kind of a huge no-no, right? Yeah. 
it, it, it definitely is a huge no-no, but here, I think this particular position, if you just chop that pawn a6 right now, the way that black will regain that pawn is by playing pawn to c4. But once you commit your pawn to c4 as black, you give up the d4 square. Mm -hmm. So white can retreat that bishop to say e2 or something like that, then play queen to d4, yeah. rook to d1, rook to c1. And I just think that black's position is very fragile. Okay. That's instructive. Hey, Robert, I'm so glad you're here. I love learning chess from you. <laughs> will you be my best friend? Oh, okay, well, let's go to let's go to Penguin GM's when, game against Wang Yue. The board two, uh, moving moving our way down that that powerhouse Xiangdu Panda list. We started with Li Chao's game versus Bartholomew. Now Wang Yue's game versus Andrew Tang. Um, again, we see Tang employing his very typical sort of obscure Queen's pawn games, either some sort of Tory London Bishop of Four Verisov kind of stuff. And and Tang is an expert in this stuff. He plays it in a lot of his rapid blitz and bullet online, and and also carries that repertoire with him over the board, which is really what the Pro Chess League is. Very serious chess. So, um, but I'm. I don't know. Again, I'm biased toward black in these types of positions where he's going to regain this pawn quickly. Normally, in this sort of Verisov structure, white is either getting a3 and b4, or sometimes the bishop's on d3 and you can play e4 and kind of it's almost like black is on the uh, or sorry, white is on like the black side of like a queen's gambit declined. But here, I kind of I kind of uh, I don't see white getting e4 to change the structure, Robert. And I feel like black is going to safely regain this c5 pawn and, and have the potential of eventually playing e5. So am I wrong, or is black kind of comfortable in this middle game already? No, I'm with you there. And the one thing I'll correct you on is you said, will you be my best friend? I thought I already we, was. Oh, so people in the I was testing was you. You passed that BFFFF uh, test. Best uh, friends for freaking, 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 freaking forever. <laughs> and well you know speaking of forever you can't leave this pawn on c5 forever like that segue there so play knight to d7 stop the knight from getting there it is i actually don't know what took him so long to play that move yeah seemed like the most logical move to play hitting the c5 pawn stopping the knight from going to b6 at the same time so if i'm andrew tang do i get a quick rook c1 pawn c4 in and try to break open the center but i agree with you i don't think that black's in any danger here yeah i do think andrew tang he plays this a lot but I think particularly against this opponent, Wang Yue, you don't want to enter anything too sharp. But honestly, the problem is you don't really want to enter the end game either. Wang Yue is such a talented well, one, end game well, player. Yeah. I mean, Wang Yue is a beast, but I think you touched on it, right? We know that Andrew Tang is a very a very strong player, especially in Bullet. But it's a different format. You're playing against 2,700 plus GM. This is not an opening that. This is this is a. It's, it has its it has its faults, I guess we would say, and against a well prepared opponent who's not going to be surprised. Um, in terms of any preparation. But at the same time, if I was Andrew's coach, I would, at this point, give him advice like, hey, expand your repertoire outside of preparation, but you don't want to change your game like right before a match. You kind of got to do what you're used to doing. I just think that this is not a great sign because Black is already in a very good opening here. E5 is coming, everybody. The C5 pawn will fall. And uh, and as as the scoreboard is showing, Wang Yue actually scored perfect 4-4 last week, which in many ways, Robert, made up for Yu Yang Yi's terrible performance on board one right yeah i think he got benched for a reason maybe he's playing somewhere but i really think that after that dismal performance last week and they still won the match yep. that's what honestly one of the big reasons i think that chong du is the heavy favorite in this matchup despite yep uh, blizzard having draws is they had their 2750 rated board one get half out of four and they still completely dominated the dallas destiny yep. All right, well, the uh, board three for the Pandas, Zhao Jun, as we see here, taking on Cristobal Henriquez. This is a little bit different. Um, okay, what was this opening here? Let me let me back this thing up, baby girl. Drive us through. Yeah, I, we had a King Zidian. When I saw the live position, I kind of thought it was a Sicilian. Yeah, I, I did sort. too, and, and that's why I said it looks different. And then I checked out the, that chess.com ECO there, which isn't always exactly the way a grandmaster would classify an opening, but pretty accurate. And here it transposed into some sort of weirdly Sicilian-ish structure. Because the reason we say that, everybody, is because Rob and I are used to seeing uh, a D pawn traded for a C pawn. If I go to an analysis board and show you a Sicilian pawn structure real quick, after E4, the knight comes out, even just go for something really straightforward like a, like a Maroxy bind. You look at this kind of structure here. If you look at just the pawns, right and you've got this guy coming here, then you've got this board here where uh, you have the same type of structure. Black has this potentially weak d6 pawn, um, and the d5 square as a permanent home for the knight. This feels like a kind of a, a bad Maroxy bind for Black, to be totally honest, Robert, because 
usually in this structure, the bishop would be on this diagonal here, the f8, a3 diagonal guarding d6. Or if it was on this diagonal, you wouldn't have your pawn on e5. You'd have it on e6 or e7 so that the bishop is still open. And I hate to sound like a broken record. I feel like we're liking Xiong Du in every game, but I also really like Xiong Du in this game right now. Yeah, I will say the one benefit for Black in a position like this, and whoa, is this who is that? Do we is need to uh, remind him to clear the fog? Yeah, <laughs> is it a, is it raining there? Uh, it's time to return from the spirit realm, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the one thing that I liked for his opponent was that his white pawn is on c4 because it seems like you don't really need it to prevent d5, and it takes away the square from the white knight. So oftentimes your knight wants to go knight d2 to c4, but of course that's not possible. Not to mention the black knight can enter to the d4 square now that you can't push a pawn backwards to um, defend against it. Well, you've heard so. of business up top on camera, party down low. Apparently Zhao Jun playing from the sauna, sitting in a jacuzzi, <laughs> got his laptop right on the side. That must be the only reason why we can see this here. So anyway... I haven't seen glass that foggy since I was trying to hide my license plate. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> um, You're a troublemaker. <laughs> All right, well, okay, no, that was that was a good point to highlight uh, some of Black's compensation in the structure, and we'll see if he can organize things with the knights coming either e6, h5, and into f4 on a dark square, or into d4. Um, I think strategically, still kind of a positive bind for white overall, because I like the rook coming to d1. I'll sink my bishop on f1, even put a pawn on g3 if I need to guard f4. And, and I, I don't know, I guess I, I'm biased to how weak that d6 pawn is potentially. But okay, we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on whether your plan comes to life too, because we got one more game to check on here, which is Zong D, as we said, the board four who played very well last week against Grandmaster Corrales, who joined us in an interview after the Blizzard moved on. It was great to have him. Um, but he's got his work cut out for him, starting with board four. He's already got a tough matchup, like right now. Yeah, but it's a tough matchup because of last week's result. But right now, I mean, he's just up a pawn. This, what, the last two moves did not really go White's way in this game. I, I thought White had a totally normal IQP structure. It's an isolated Queen's pawn. And then he just gave up the pawn. And he's going for activity here. But I really don't feel like it's going to work out. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, the White is trying to go for a Rook D1, pinning this Knight. And it's very wishful thinking but you've given up a full pawn. So black at some point is going to play a six, which threatens pawn to b five. And black can also play a move like queen to d six to attack your knight on e five, and then try to um, maneuver out of any potential pins. Yeah. I mean, I might be overestimating black's position, but I don't think, I don't see enough compensation, nothing concrete here that leads me to believe that white is doing well enough to have given up that pawn. No, I agree with you, um, especially because, as you said here, it looked like a very normal IQP. You can play on move 11, rook c1 instead. Things like a3, bishop back to a2 are typical plans. Um, obviously, white sometimes keeps an idea of punching d5 through yourself, but playing queen a4, I mean, there's no way Zhang Di blundered that rook d1 just didn't work because the knight can clearly take f3 with check, and now black is up a pawn. Um, and White's king is open. So Song D clearly had this idea in mind to meet knight takes d4 with knight e5, but I'm with you. It doesn't feel concrete enough. Uh, Corrales has a number of moves he can play here. I mean, even even h6 now, try to, try to get the bishop pair off the board, hit the bishop. If they take f6, you come here with tempo on the knight. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm with you. I agree. Yeah, it's not like I see any concrete for black either, and I can see this game totally collapsing for Corrales, but in the current position, I'm just looking at it I'm like, okay, if I go a6, bishop b7, try to go b5 or something like that, then it looks like natural development from black's point of view, and it will fork the queen and the bishop over there. So, Well, yeah. if we go back up through the order that we did, back to the board one from Shang 2 and his board four matchup versus John Bartholomew, we've got a really wild position that's developed here. Um Material is actually equal in this current position, but uh, totally different dynamics, right? Black has a completely wide open king and maybe a ton of weak pawns to go with it. Um, I, I actually really like Bartholomew's chances here just from a practical point of view. I mean, just given that how open Li Chao's king is. Yeah, well, if we go back two moves to move 26, Black made the pawn to f5 which I don't fully comprehend. I, I don't see why that move, pawn move was necessary. I don't see why that pawn move was good. And I think, I think John reacted perfectly to it. Like he went F5. The, the 94 didn't need any more defenders. 
Then F3 came, and look at that pawn in F5, as you just mentioned. I mean, just what does Black even do here to defend all of the hanging pieces? I don't know. I mean, the biggest worry you have right now if you're in the Finns and Minnesota Blizzard corner is the fact that he's he's down way on the clock. But I agree. I mean, the bishop feels loose. The pawn is still a weakness. F5 is under target. And even if you just asked... If you just ask somebody, like, do you want, how do you get chances against a GM of Lee Chow's caliber? You hope for a position like this because he's still human, even if he's 2,700, and anybody makes a blunder in rapid chess when their king's wide open. Um, yeah. And I completely agree. And I think if you're Lee Chow, you just start thinking, how do I uh, lessen the damage? I would play move queen e5, try to offer the exchange of queens. I know that after queen e5, that John Brother is going to take that queen on e5, and he played it. Rook takes and then play pawn f4 to try and win this f5 pawn. But I think if you start trading pawns off the board, Black's chances of holding a position go goes up a lot. Yeah. So I think this is a great decision by Lee Chow, very good practical decision, and um, perhaps the only and the best move. Is queen to b6 a possibility here? Keeping the queens yeah, on the board, hitting the rook, and then maybe you go back to your f4 idea. Yeah, the, the problem with queen to b6, if I go rook c5, I'm kind of locking your queen out of the king side. Okay. And that might be totally fine for white, right? Because you have this past a pawn. Yep. But as soon as you go rook c5, I'm going to follow up with queen takes g3 if you let me, or queen to c3. And so there's like these dynamics at play where all of a sudden white's feeling a little bit uncomfortable. There's some loose pieces, but it honestly might just be good. No, I think you're right. I'm actually showing the line you talked about on the board. And I think especially because queen takes g3 came with a follow-up threat of bishop takes f3, you were, you were definitely right. And so... Instead, John indeed trades. He'll probably follow with your idea of F4. Indeed, he does. We'll see if he can make something of this endgame. Andrew Tang doesn't have a lot of time to make something of his game. Already down to three minutes. And Tang, being the bullet specialist he is, sometimes I think I think Andrew sometimes feels more comfortable with less than a minute on the clock. I'm not kidding. Like, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why he may end up being somebody who qualifies for our bullet chess championship. I'm pretty sure Andrew's going to be playing in the qualifiers on Wednesday and Thursday next week. Um, so we'll see. But... Uh, you know, Andrew under under a lot of time pressure against Wang Yue here, and we're not even to move 15 yet. I honestly wonder if he puts pressure on himself and, and like, I have to win these games, right? Because he is such a bullet and blitz phenom, well, particularly bullet, that, you know, he's used to winning in online competitions, but not winning against Wang Yue in a 15-minute game. So I wonder, I really do wonder if he just puts a lot of pressure on himself because you can't spend this much time. I just sort of... If I was his coach, I would say, this is terrible time management. Why do you have three minutes left and it's move 14 in a very normal position? Well, yep. the reason why is you're searching for an advantage, which is great. Of course, you should try to play for an advantage with the white pieces. But the disadvantage, sometimes it's better to just make quick moves than to find the single best searching for the truth move. Right. Well, um, Bartholomew, is uh, he's searching for something here. He might be searching for a victory. That would be a huge way for the Blizzard to start. If he wins the d6 pawn, we're going to have a race of past c pawn versus past e pawn. Um, you, you feel like black should be okay, I guess, because his pawn's further advanced, but white is also... Okay, interesting decision. He decides he's 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 not going to trade, and Li Chao agrees. He'd much rather hold d6 than win a4. Yeah, and I was like, why do you play king f2 if he's just going to take on d6 next? Well, rook takes d6 would have hung the bishop on f5, so... Ah, um, that's I was blundering. Important. Let's show that. Always good to show a blunder by Danny. Ready? No, I, I didn't even see you blundered. I was blundering it mentally. Rook so. takes and rook takes f5 was a pin emote. Use your pin emotes. We saw we just had another Twitch Prime sub. Thank you, Caribbee. Caribbee for Twitch Prime sub. Yeah, all right. Um, okay, but here comes John. He's played e5. Trying to speed up here. Um, again, the time management for the Blizzard in this round might be the biggest source of criticism. Tang and, and uh, Bartholomew are holding their own on the board, I guess, at the moment. Uh, as you predicted, Robert, Zong D is just down a clear pawn here. Like, doesn't look like yeah. anything happened besides simplification, and um, Corrales should go on to beat Shang Du's board four. So what about Chess Fat Bear, the best username uh, maybe ever? Chess Fat Bear? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, can we get a fact check on that? Chess Fat Bear. Best, best username ever. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is a great username, uh, and he honestly has a great position. That pawn d6 still backwards. There is a an Ivanchuk like pawn to c5 thrust in the air here because if for those of you who know your chess history, Ivanchuk beat Kaspar of Linares 1991, three, one, I think, and with this a nice c5 pawn sacrifice to throw your knight into c4, and I'm feeling that coming up yep. here, maybe right now. 
Just I feel like it's unnecessary, mainly because positionally you're so much better. But I, I agree, it's a great... First of all, shout out to you for the amazing historical chess reference. Let me just show the idea of Robert saying is C5. The point on this kind of tactic is after takes, you come here again with another tempo, and you're threatening things like knight d6. You've got f7 and b7 hanging in the air. So a real shocker of a move to put a pawn on a square where black has four pieces attacking it. But I kind of agree that it wasn't necessary here, Robert. You do get a little more frisky when they're not your pieces. Come on, admit it. You tend I to sacrifice. Do. I absolutely do. And what is going on in JB's game? Because all of a sudden, JB sacrificed his rook for a bishop, and he's got his pawn in the seventh rank. But I don't know if that was a good decision because all of a sudden, Lee Chow can get this pawn from behind with rook to d2. And isn't black oh, going to no. be the one up a pawn in this endgame? Oh, no. Wow. Oh, no. Oh, no is absolutely yeah, right. He this sacrificed is... the exchange with rook d7 thinking he was winning. I wonder if he blundered this check in reverse. Uh, never forget about the back oh, no. door. There you go. Oh, no. And uh, Yeah, I just... And not to pull a spoiler here, I just saw the movie Us today, so definitely don't forget about the back door. But here, all of a sudden, I mean, look at Li Chao. His king is active. He can play rook c7 to protect his c pawn. And as soon as that rook moves away from c1 to stop attacking my c4 pawn, then I will take this pawn d7. I see Hikaru in the chat goes, oh, no, is right. Yeah, unnecessary sacrifice by Tholomew. Hikaru Nakamura confirmed. By the way, I want to talk to you about how many horror movies you've been watching. Your mom and I have been talking about it. I don't know that it's good for your brain. To see us I love in movies. theater. Just okay. Get out of here. Leave me alone. All right. Um, anyway, yeah, so we'll see if uh, Bartholomew can set up some sort of blockade to try to hold, but definitely feels that Rook D7 was unnecessary. Unfortunately, I recognize that deep breath by John. That's a bit of a regretful deep breath. Um, yeah, he, he looks very upset. And I think if he, he needs to calm down, he's 30 seconds left. It's not going to be easy, but maybe he has some chances to hold this endgame, but not that many pawns remaining. Yeah. Doesn't look good, honestly. I don't think he's going to hold this. But, uh, you know, it's one of those moments where you can't resign before the game's over. Certainly not. And uh, it's going to be a game that may not be over. We have a knight on d7 in Tang's game and time ticking away for Wang Yue. What is going on here? First, I like that rhyme there. Time is ticking away for Wang Yue. Well played. Hey, but inadvertent that, rhyme time. What? That knight on d7 is really annoying. You can't castle kingside because... Yeah. You can't castle through checks. So bishop a7, you can probably just take that pawn on c4. And but then rook d8, can I kick your knight away? Is, am I finally getting the castle? Okay, first got to um, put the bishop on what, e7, right? I, I wasn't sure if e7 or a7. Both are reasonable I thought, e, I, think e7 I thought e7 better. to avoid things like the bishop coming to d6. Um, but because okay, of bishop fair. a7, I can actually play bishop d6 right away because you can't take the knight due to some sort of discovered check. Yeah, that's actually really annoying. I won't be able to castle him. Okay, and he soon. does indeed play bishop b 7 So I think that was best. And I think Tang might even just play knight b6 and then try to get the rook to d7 in some positions. But I guess don't move the knight now as long as it's preventing castles, right? Find a way to keep actually, the initiative. I like your move knight b6 because if you play rook d8, it's your only rook move. I'll take you on d8. You'll probably take me with the... Okay, he took on c4. Maybe that's better, question mark? Probably. Actually, that just looks yeah, good. Yeah, it keeps I mean, the king is... in the center. Honestly, this is this has become uh, quite the turn after a very mediocre opening by Tang. This is uh, a, a position he's turned into a lot of tactics, and I, I like that knight on d7. That was a great move by Wang Yue that I think will go unappreciated if I don't point it out. I think white was threatening queen to b3 to attack b7, and there was no way to defend it. So queen h5 quote-unquote threatens i'm bringing quote because i'm really a threat it's a defensive resource queen to b5 yeah. he, he played a4 that have stopped queen b5 which would have protected b7 and offered a queen trade so like now rook d8 to kick the knight out makes perfect sense i would play that oh not immediately i do have to think a little bit but rook d8 i need to get that knight out yep i'm not sure how you keep he, it he there does it. Rook d8. honestly this is starting to turn like wait that rook on d1's hanging how do you oh it's pinned Oh my gosh, the knight is pinned to the rook. Queen h5, a dual-purpose move. And that is... I was literally just reading an article about moves like Oh, he like blundered this. his rook! What? He blundered his rook for free! He just blundered his rook on d1! Oh no! Again, I was just reading an article about deceptive defensive moves. A move move that's played that looks only for defense, but actually has attack. And I know you're thinking, Danny, you can read? What? <laughs> right? But hey... As, as Ikaru Nakamura wow. would say, Queen H5, that was a grandmaster move right there, okay? 
That move oh, looks no. like it's only defending Queen B5, as Robert pointed out, but it actually was just a, a pin. Oh, my gosh. Heartbreaking loss right there to start the match, oh. not only for Andrew Tang, but also for Finzo905, who did indeed go down here. That's Jean Bartholomew. And this is why the Xiangdu Pandas are so tough, everybody. Uh, all right, we move on to the Chess Fat Pandas game. Wowzers. Chess Fat Panda. Chess Fat Bear. But I actually like what you said <laughs> better. Fat Panda. fat Panda sounds Although, like a bit of a redundant. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. Is, wait, his knights are stuck protecting each other. So if you go A6, what? Wait, what are you doing after A6? Aren't, aren't I just taking one of your knights? Uh, and wait, also Black's up two pawns right now. What's going on here? Well, White's the bishop's on... hanging on B7, so... Um... Oh, I forgot about that. But your knight on B5 is hanging. Firstly, I, Danny, great for po pointing out that the bishop on B7 is hanging. I didn't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was the like... thing is, you have such a grandmaster, like, allure over me. You're highlighting this stuff, and it takes me, like... Uh, like 30 seconds to interrupt you and be like, the bishop on B7's hanging. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the good news is, I mean, you take on B7, I take you on yeah, B5. I have because I actually don't think you were wrong that A6 was the best move, and indeed he played it. Um, I just didn't see it. I, I'd be completely transparent with you. I did not see that the bishop was hanging. No, but, but it's, it's a still nice a good... move, A6, because if knight B7, A takes B5, as you said, A2 is falling faster than anything white can come up with, because I think if rook C7's played, black has knight C5, and everything's defended, and the A2 pawn's going to fall. Yep. This looks like a big problem. Although, Look at us accidentally guess... creating magic together. Yeah. Do you believe in magic? Kind of like my... Never mind. I was going to say something. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I wanted you to finish Okay, that Corrales did indeed take down Zong D. So the Blizzard have done what they were supposed to do in the board one versus board four matchup. But um, unfortunately, it looks like... Well, actually, okay, maybe maybe Henriquez is getting something here. I don't I don't know that the Blacks gonna have winning chances, but I like that move. I think that's this is better than um, taking on B seven. I think this knight c seven move you can't take on D six without losing your rook on A eight, and then I'll have rook C eight check at the end of that to pick up your bishop. So you can't just go ahead and take on D six. So rook B eight was necessary to protect that bishop on B seven. But now if I'm white, I take the bishop on B seven, take the pawn on E six and struggle to make a draw. But that looks much more feasible than it did in some of the other variations. So I think knight takes b7, rook b7, knight e6. And, well, there's some double pawns. You just put the rook on c6. You have ideas of knight d8 and then the knight coming to c6 in some of those positions, which is it's only irritating because black can't always play moves like rook c8 due to things like knight e7, discovered check on the rook. So, I mean, white has some yeah. ways to wiggle and create kind of um, irritating threats. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and also, you know, with the 96, you're throwing to you take the bishop and win the h6 pawn, which may not seem very valuable now, but later when white starts getting a majority on the king side, then, you, oh, also black is 34 seconds. I didn't even look at the clock. Crystal Ball is one of the few that's reaching the elusive 50 club. I think you're still outside the 50 club. I don't want to rub it in your face or anything. I know how much you're trying to get there. What's the, oh, for Puzzle 50 Rush? and Puzzle Rush. I was like, I have no idea what Haven't the 50 club Haven't you reached 49 is? like several times? Yeah, but I haven't played in a long while. Should I play later after the show? Should I play now while you're doing commentary? Yeah, ignore me and do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to ignore you. You're like, Robert, Robert, Robert. I'm like, 94. You're like, how'd you know? I'm like, oh, well, I'm talking about the puzzle rush position. All right, well, if you're just joining us, this is the Pro Chess League Pacific Division quarterfinals. One of these teams will be heading to the live esports finale in San Francisco, uh, May 4th and 5th. Right now, Shangdu with a 2-1 lead, but Cristobal Henriquez trying to get a point here as black, or at least a half a point, to keep the Blizzard in good shape after the first set of four games. Um, an instructive game right now. I think your line is is probably just the most straightforward. Take, take on B7 and then take on E6. Because what else are you doing with that knight that's under attack right now on d6? I don't even. I honestly don't even know what he's thinking about. He's got less than thirty also, seconds. Also, he's twenty. Yeah. What, is, he, is he still there? Do we have his I know, camera? Can we like, get him on camera? Uh, Zhao Jun here. I know he's in the. Uh, he's trapped in the sauna. Either that, or he's looking for his constant to escape the spirit realm. But Zhao Jun yeah. has been. Zhao Jun has been lost in the fog since before that movie got a twenty percent <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I just like saw his camera again. I mean, you just really, I don't even know what he's doing there, but uh, he, he just, <laughs> five seconds, four seconds. This guy just, is this, 
I mean, I, I, not that we don't know who he is or anything, but this is like, again, I haven't seen something. I haven't been a part of anything this foggy since I was trying to shield my license plate from flash cameras. It's honestly unbelievable. He needs just to wipe that camera. <laughs> it's it's it can, totally. For his birthday, anyone know what his birthday is? I will send him one. This one of those little mini wipes, fog cleaners. Uh, but okay, he's taking some pawns in the center. Black is using the three-on-one majority. Both oh, 2.5. He may have with half a second left. Wow. Rooks living oh, like he's oh my god remember everybody he gets two seconds for every move oh, oh. but he blunders look at that the blizzard yeah. get a huge win there i mean that is a if this goes down to be a super close match in the end that is one of those games you will remember uh cristobal henriquez is sort of the underdog here on board three against Zhao Jun, but he came up with a big win there, Robert, and we are tied headed into round two. Yeah, that was a huge upset. I mean, he had the black pieces. He was playing against a GM who outrates him by 100 points. I know Cristobal Enriquez is a very, very talented chess player, and especially in the quicker time controls, but he had a bad position as well. We were highlighting his weak pawn on D6. Yep. Somehow, Zhao Jun went all in with sacrificing two pawns. Well, you know what he we went tuned for? He went for your crazy, crazy Ivanchuk idea with C5. <laughs> but he did it a move too late. So you're saying like he did C5 earlier. For those of you just getting here, Robert was highlighting and a brilliant historical reference in the process. And we are back uh, live with all of you here. You guys just barely passed that test. All 4,500 of you were given a test of our love, like any dysfunctional relationship. In a weird passive-aggressive way, you passed, and now we know that you love us even more. Grandmaster Robert Hess with me. Round two set to begin here between Xiong Du and Minnesota. Robert, here we go. Tie game. Last game of the year, Dan. Can't hold anything back now. You know, I was on the verge of tears. You know how much I love commentating on chess, and all of a sudden it was robbed from me. It was taken away. I know. And I felt like, you know, just – I just felt like just a pang of anger. As but Chuck Norris back. once taught me, sometimes you have to taketh away – in order for it to be appreciated when you giveth. And uh, we uh, we are back here. Li Chao now taking on Andrew Tang in a very, very fast-paced Joko Piano. Evans Gambit accepted. Robert, this is right up your alley. It is. Um, well, here you can take on E5. Uh -huh. And the point is after the queen trade, all of a sudden black is not as unhappy as in some other versions. A queen A4 check was probably the move to play. That way you encourage c6, otherwise you lose the knight on a5. And now knight takes e5, recaptures the pawn, but leaves white with this bad pawn structure, right? a2 right. and c3 are not connected. Black can develop naturally with knight f6, and then castle, and play queen to c7. And so these moves come quite easily to black. And I I don't love the opening choice by Lee Chow, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah, uh, and very confident approach here from Andrew, which you have to... You have to be happy with. Again, last game, after kind of a weird start, he actually got a really dynamic position against Wang Yue and then blundered his rook. Partly, though, I think because he started getting nervous about his time, you have this, like, renewed sense of commitment here. You can feel that Andrew is trying to play very quickly here. He is. And Li Chao doing the same, which means that he must be in his opening repertoire. I just don't personally like that opening repertoire. I think that black actually does quite okay in these lines. Yeah. And it's the dynamic of, yes, white wants that four on three in the center start mobilizing you. You can imagine that knight leaving the E5 square and your pawn pushing to E5 and then maybe try to push your pawn, other pawn to F5. You're getting just quick space in the center to keep pushing your pawns. But yep. on the flip side, you have those disconnected pawns on the queen side, right? A2, C3, not connected, harder to defend. Black can at some moment play pawn to B5 to kick your queen out, take over the C4 square, develop this light score bishop, and then connect the rook. So it's, you know, I don't want to make it sound like Black is completely better here or anything like that. I just prefer having two pawn islands versus having three. Right. Well, you are a positional girl in a positional world, right? So you, know. you would prefer the uh, you would prefer the better positional approach. Just kidding. Let's go and on to this close Sicilian with early G3. Here we've got Zong D, the Superman from board four. If you followed the first week of the 2019 Pro Chess League playoffs, this young man here playing very underrated chess here for the Pandas, but he lost his first game this week. Now he's got Cristobal Henriquez. Robert, you know both of us like this position for black, right? Uh, well, who's both? I mean... You and Aaron? 
Me and you. <laughs> exactly. Oh, <okay. laughs> well, as somebody who is a recovering closed Sicilian player, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I actually don't mind this position at all from the white side because you take on d5, just happened. Pawn takes d5 in return, and then white plays d4. And yeah. pawn on d5 actually feels a bit vulnerable in some of these variations. Uh -huh. uh, and my bishop on g2 is in the perfect spot to put pressure on it. And, okay, honestly, black is doing okay in these lines typically, but you have to know what you're doing. You really do. And especially in this particular line because e takes d5, and then I play d4. These not one of those lines where you let white capture on c5, right? Sometimes you just play a move like bishop e7 or something of that nature and allow the d, c, d takes c5 to happen. Uh, but here you just should take on d4 with your pawn, allow the knight takes d4, they may gain a tempo gaining move like bishop to g4. So the quick action taking advantage of the fact that white spent two moves developing this bishop, g3, then bishop g2, and yep. black is the first one into the action here. So knight takes d5, I don't like. Yeah, I, I don't like that. Nearly as much as the lines you were talking about, where yes, d5 could be a target, but as you said, black can get a quick development, e, you know, cd, knight d4, bishop g4, gain an initiative. Now now you're trying to avoid positional problems, but you may end up getting more of them. Now that white gets castled, eventually d4 will come, and now the pawn will be fixed as a target, and you won't get that sort of quick development as compensation, right? And also, you know, if you do play d4 as black, then white has this open bishop, right? The g2 bishop is perfectly placed. Yep. Well, now knight f4 is just the move to play. It's actually, okay, play d4. There's two different options. One's to play knight f4 to open up the diagonal. The other is to play d4 to cement that pawn in its place in d5 and just go after it. And I love white's position. He's a much stronger player. So, so far, Cristobal Enriquez has been the all-star of this matchup. I know we're only one game in, yep. but that was very instructive and excellent win in his first game and here i think he's just gonna steamroll his much lower rated opponent with the white pieces yeah especially when this is the kind of position that a grandmaster with more experience wants against a young player right it's it's safe tactically isolated queen pawn right that you can play for positionally all that sort of stuff let's check on uh corrales's game against zhao jun here we have a berlin and this is oh, no. <laughs> We're gonna check on it, Robert. Whether you whether it's a Berlin or not, okay? You can't pick on the Berlin this early in the show. Oh, please. Um, but okay, Berlin. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's defined as as early as move three here in the Rui Lopez. But really, the main lines of the Berlin are defined as what you see on the board when the queens come off here on move eight. And okay, as Robert just said with his with his tone there, he doesn't really want to analyze an endgame that's been seen a million times. But uh, in in uh, the truth is, it's been played at the highest levels. Precisely because it does offer a lot of different maneuvering ideas for both sides. Black feels like he can play for a win with the bishop pair despite having double pawns. And white says, hey, you have double pawns and I have four healthy ones on the king side. So I'm just going to keep playing this position and be better. Hence where we are, where people just keep playing the Berlin over and over and we're all sick of seeing it, right? Did I summarize it correctly, Robert? Yeah, and that's really the reason why. I mean, I play the Berlin from mainly from the black side uh, because I don't like entering from the white side. And the point that the top player is trying to make is I can play this for a win from either side. That's really yep. the dynamic that they use at the highest of levels. So right now, Jun Zha, uh, Zha Jun, excuse me, with the black pieces, he has to make a choice. Some lines you play B6, C5, Bishop to B7. Other times you bring your Bishop out in the diagonal it's currently on with a move like Bishop to E6 or Bishop to F5. No matter what, your King is already stuck in the center because he played the King E8 version. Mm -hmm. uh, I typically don't like to play this side, this particular line from the black side because I don't like having my king in the center when rooks are just going to, well, one rook can go to e1, the other rook can go to d1, and I feel quite uncomfortable with my king just sitting there and not sitting particularly pretty. So I think from black's perspective here, he really he played bishop e7, so he didn't touch his, yeah, I was going to say, rook e1 comes, is invited. This is, this is the kind of variation of the Berlin, though, where you get in trouble if I'm... <sighs> Okay, I I know that you you prefer you prefer White's position here, and I actually um, probably have been a little more biased toward Black playing the Berlin. But this is exactly the kind of Berlin where you're in trouble because usually your king is able to find safety on the queen side in lines where Black is successful. B6, King B7, the light square bishop finds a home on E6 or F5 or something. This feels like this is, feels like one where Black's going to be suffering for a while. Yeah, because White also has knight sacrifices. Right? If I if I got another move. Oh, knight d6 now, for example. Yeah, right? even now. 
you take me with your pawn, I take back with my pawn. Then I'm going to try to push my pawn to d7 to trap your bishop on c8, get my rook to the seventh rank. I think, I think knight d6 is a great move. And this is why, I mean, look how slow this is. King, e, King d8 to e8, e8 to f8, yeah, f8 to g8. You just, it's not really So what went wrong here, though? Uh, your Berlin uh, hatred aside, this is mainline theory here. King e8, I guess that's already a commitment to this type of variation versus some of the more traditional moves with bishop d7. King e8, of course, is theory, though. King e8, h3, h6, b3, and then knight back to e7. Um, I think that after h3, h6 is not typically played, but h5, that's one thing, uh, because the point of playing h5 early on to stop white from going g4 so easily, otherwise it would open up the h5 right. for your pieces. And so he ended up playing h6, then knight to e7, which similarly didn't make too much sense to me because why, what's the knight, why is the knight better on g6 than on, on f5? It's right. not. Well, I think so the I only think... reason is because of what you highlighted, right? Trying to avoid um, the um, trying to avoid the tempo of g4 because he didn't play h5, but maybe this is all just one mistake leading to a second mistake, right? Yeah, it's. Um, it, I think it's actually mixing up variations, honestly, because in some lines you play knight f5 to e7 and g6, others you don't. And right now, rushing the king over to the king side like this to go king h7 to connect your rooks is just very slow. And if I'm Fidel Corrales, now is the time to take advantage of it. And playing knight d6, I don't see a better move. I don't really, another move doesn't even really come to mind once I see that move. Well, I guess the only king counter argument for that is that white is already better and black still hasn't even solved this sort of very long journey to the king side. So, I mean, you could play slower moves and event, I mean, the more traditional or let's say slower plan for white would involve moves like trying to get things where you move the knight from the f-file to eventually mobilize your four on three. But actually, the more I look at it, the more I think you're you're totally right. Because in the lines where the you play b3 and then bishop b2, your bishop isn't on that h2, like c7 diagonal where you can support things like f4. In this position, it's going to be very hard to mobilize the king side pawns quickly for white. Because if you ever play g4, black will, black will strike with h5 and try to start undermining it uh, for the rook and the bishop. So... So, okay, yeah, the more I look at it, the more I can't argue with knight d6. Why am I trying to argue with you? I love you anyway. I don't get it. I don't know, but we're not going to argue over John Bartholomew's position. I promise you that because I just my, caught my eye as it's the least JB-like position ever. Could you believe he's on the black side of this position? He's like, is this John <laughs> Bartholomew or are you happy to see me? Like, he's, he's, is John playing for a win? I can't believe it. With the black pieces, <laughs> right. like, like what happened? How did this? How did he do this? But I love his position, frankly. Yeah. Because now he should play the move either a six to challenge this bishop on b five, or to play e five immediately. And the reason why e five works is because after pawn takes e five, pawn takes e five, you can take my pawn with bishop takes e five because I can't take you back with my knight, but I can pin your bishop with my queen by playing with my queen to e six. So this variation works out in black's favor because white's king's still in the center. Um, I, yeah, what happened to John Yeah, Barthelon? let's look at this. What happened here? We had John a, Brink look at that. Wang, Wang Yue is returning the Andrew Tang favor. He actually played the, the same system with this move, two bishop f4 on the queen's pawn. Uh, John takes a different, kind of more uh, tra traditional approach, strategically very symmetrical, but then he plays f6. He plays f6 on move seven, Robert. I'm, I'm all about it. As long as he's not playing the Scandinavian, I'm happy to see him yeah. play whatever opening he wants. But he got super aggressive here. And yeah. he played a, a6. So this could be a critical moment. I think it's a good move, but it's a very tame move. So now yeah. white takes his knight on c6. Otherwise, black's getting e5 with full force. And after bishop c6, queen? Uh, I don't know how you're going to take back, honestly. I'm, I'm struggling to... I, I feel like queen takes c6 will be the move. Um I, I agree with you though. You could also take with the pawn and then and then try to use the B file, but with the bishop on f4, I just I tend to doubt it. But I agree with you that e5 would have been the all-in John Bartholomew. Really get Wang Yue questioning his haircut choice there, but instead he didn't play it. And uh, and yeah, Wang Yue is very expressive with his eyes. I mean, we can't see his eyes half the time because he's ducking yep. below uh, the camera, but he's been. Is very clear when he's reacting to something. And so bishop c6, queen c6, knight e3 now. I just think that white's getting his pieces out. He's this if e5 isn't happening, that e pawn might become a backwards pawn in the target. So he played the move knight to g3. I thought knight e3 was stronger. I mean, okay, I trust him. He's 2680. But I don't like how his opening has gone. So Wang Yue has 
done some weird things in this game, but mm-hmm. I think his vision has improved in the last couple moves. I agree. And you, and also agreed with your assessment. It's not totally typical uh, John Bartholomew chess, but uh, maybe it pays off. Whoa. Speaking of an, of an atypical position, look at the, Look at the one between Tang and Li Chao now. Um, uh, um, what's what's the count here? Wait, it's, so there's a knight. It, oh, it's White's move. I was like, can you just take this knight on g5? But I have to learn to see whose move it is. Well, and the White is up a pawn. Whoa, Li Chao looks real unhappy there. What's wrong with you, buddy? Yeah, <laughs> somebody okay, so stole, he, he, somebody he stole his crying? panda. Is, are those tears of happiness or sadness? Oh, he's back. He's okay. He's fine. back to being, being more normal. Um, I, I don't know. It's just he just looked really upset when we first saw him on camera. I got worried about him for a minute. Uh, yeah, I, I, I he's okay. I, I, he's very expressive. I don't know what those expressions mean. Yeah, but <laughs> it's very expressive, and I don't know what they mean. But his position looks excellent here with yep. the white pieces because. At some point, you might just sacrifice on f7 and then just mobilize your pawns, right? So if you go knight g takes f7 and uh, tank takes back on f7, you just keep capturing. And at the end of that, you probably play e5 and your pawns just start rolling up the board. The black king is unsafe. Uh, it's going to be under an attack in short order. Yeah. Um, the question is, are you pushing e5 or f5 first? Because both have merit, especially if you can even follow with some sort of entry into the light squares here. Uh, you wouldn't let the white, uh, the black king ever get back to safety. So, okay, yeah, taking of seven. Obviously there it is. Something, oh, and he played it. It's something he was thinking about. Something he decided to play. And uh, this is going to be this is going to be a wild one down the stretch. Um, okay, look at your your move that you called for was played against Chess Fat Panda, and uh, Corrales puts the knight on d6 and. We may get the exact line Robert highlighted a few minutes ago if you're just joining us. If C takes, takes, the reason this piece sacrifice works is because black... Okay, uh, bishop f6 would allow me to take it, so maybe even bishop f8 is better. But the point is that black is immediately losing the piece back and white is getting full control over this critical area of the board on the 7th rank. And, um, okay, I think knight d6... S- it didn't surprise him. It it definitely it w- is enough for him to pause here because he hasn't moved. He's he's in in a couple minute think here, trying to come up with the right defense. Well, he just realized that his plan was bad. Frankly speaking, I mean, this king, like I said, king cannot walk from d eight to e eight to f eight to g eight in consecutive order while your opponent is making all the natural developing moves. And there comes the ambulance trying to uh, fix his position but it's not fixable the problem here is you take on d6 and let's say i go c takes d6 e d6 bishop d6 rook d6 so we, you know we just say I, we'll have opposite colored bishops normally in opposite colored bishops position you say i have very good drawing chances here white has all of the play in the position so yes you're going to play king h7 as your follow-up then white might even play knight to d4 and i'm saying your bishop on c8 where is it going it's not developing your knight on g6 it's just a defensive piece covering the e7 square for my rook. So I just think that white holds all the cards in the position he's going for because he's no other choice. But obviously, this is not what you <laughs> – you don't go into this opening right. trying to play this position and try to defend what is a not easy position. Well, we're going to get the line you just talked about, and I think you highlighted Black's problems well. We'll see if uh, Jimenez uh, likes knight d4 like you just said. Um Black's goal might be after a move like knight d4 to play something like a6 to guard b5 just so you can try to punch c5 through and kick this knight without letting it into the b5 square. Um, yeah, the, the ambulance is still coming. It's how how much it's feeling for his position. They're not stopping. They'll, they'll keep coming all night here. And the problem is if you go a6, hey, go away. Hey, okay, they're gone. somebody needs help out there, Robert. Let them right, be. Which is, I'm trying to have them speed up. Right. <laughs> so uh yeah, the problem with playing a6 is then white can just play bishop a3 and you're not playing c5 and you're giving away even more dark squares. Yeah. Well and and Corrales kind of recognizes that he, he has some time actually in the position. He plays the move c4. Um I would assume he prepares to meet bishop e6 with the move like knight d4. No, but then black can play rook d8. Well, no, I guess five. I guess the trade would be fine. Would be fine for white. Okay. Um, I do wonder if you ever played bishop e6 and I'll take with my e rook 
and then play rook to d7 as like a as an exchange sacrifice just to have a roving rook on the seventh rank and start winning some pawns. That's a really instructive idea. I'm going to highlight it here. Takes, takes, and rook d7. Note Robert is not sacrificing the exchange for the pawn, but actually for the initiative where the rook and bishop are meeting together on g7 for lots of pressure. So pretty typical anyway when you're ever you're looking to sacrifice material not to try to start comparing apples to apples to apples because it's really apples to oranges you want to look for the initiative and threats when you're giving up material so nice um all right um uh, still like we said several other games interesting we haven't checked on henrique's game with zong d uh good news for the blizzard is that he's still He's still doing what he's supposed to do, that being Grandmaster Henriquez is just much better here against the board four from China. Um, this is like an easy two-result position, we say in chess, where the rook comes to the e-file. White can trade up the dark square bishops whenever he wants to make sure he can infiltrate in to squares like e7 and then c7. And two results kind of means that White might win, but he pretty much can never lose. So it's a great position to be if you're a Blizzard fan. Yeah, though I'm a little scared that the game is closer to drawish territory than it is to winning territory. I think right now I don't see any infiltration squares for Enriquez, and I'm not sure how to find any. Yes, you can play a move like bishop to e7 to try to take over the e7 square for your rook, but black can always shut down the file with bishop to e6 himself, and I don't know. I, I'm worried that you know, he's not going to get the kind of winning push that he really needs. And I like what he's doing. He's going to go H3. He's going to go G4. He's going to try to play pawn to G5. That's really the goal here. And maybe that that is the... I actually don't know how Black stops that now that I think about it a little more. You're right, Danny. No, this is a two-results game for White, and only Black can go wrong here. There's no weaknesses in White's position. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that Enrique is going to continue pushing this. To Zhang Di's credit, he has kept even on the clock, which is not easy, um, especially when you're playing a grandmaster of Enriquez's caliber. So, yeah. Sorry, Robert. Getting slightly distracted here with a production issue offside, but you know what matters? You're not getting distracted because uh, you're a true professional focused on giving the people what they need, chess principles. All right. I'm trying my best. That's all I can do, right? <laughs> That's all you do. Um, all right. Let's go back to this game here. Um, the uh, the Penguin GM game because Andrew Tang, uh, well known, whoa, queen to c3, but but black is up a piece right if we're counting if we're counting uh, material as it stands right now. A queen c2 check is about to be very very painful. Ah, uh, yeah. Because yeah. your nine eight five is hanging as well, for good measure. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, this just looks terrible for Tang. And okay, when Rook G eight, he, he try, plays Rook G eight, trying so to find a that. defense. Yeah, just don't blunder checkmate in one move on G two. We saw Tang blunder a full Rook in the first game. Yep. That obviously wasn't good. Here, if you're Li Chao, do you know, Knight G six check? You can play to win that Rook, but I think even I'll a simple him. move like Bishop B two makes sense, bringing the Bishop to that diagonal where the King now resides. I like that Bishop B two is a good move for sure. Just go on the long diagonal. It's not like Black has any move useful move because you can't stop Knight G six yep. check. At least not that I oh, see. Oh wow! But, so okay. he he likes your more forcing approach. The main point is that if Rook takes Queen takes, there is no Rook G eight with a skewer on G two because H six is falling. Um, yeah, then the bishop comes to b2 anyway. Honestly, that looks two. super tough, and I think Andrew agrees there. Um, okay, but, you know, these first two games of the match were exactly where uh, the Blizzard third bore, that be, being Andrew Tang, would have his toughest opponents. Um, of course, he started out against uh, Wang Yue, and, and now he's playing Li Chao. So we'll see if he can recover in the, in the later games, but it definitely looks like he's about to go to an 0-2 start. Yeah. And unfortunately for him, it's you know, that first game he had a good position. His knight was on d7. This game has not been so kind to him. Yep. Some of his teammates are trying to lift him up in the process, right? Because we saw Enriquez win that very nice game uh, the first round. And John Bartholomew right now is trying his best to knock off a super heavyweight in Wang Yue, just one of the best players in the world. That would maybe be John Bartholomew's best win ever. Uh, we'd have to ask him. But um, there are a few players on the planet to beat that are better than Wang Yue. What's it, number? 40 in the world and yeah. used to be 2750. 
He's one of the you know, earlier Chinese superstars. And right now he's still a very talented player, but his position is anything but good here. I don't like it at all. The Bishop on D5 is such a beautiful piece. Well, we can see uh, Li Chao kind of pondering over how he how he's going to put this one away, but uh, the manager of the Pandas and very strong grandmaster himself is about to do it. But as Robert said, let's look at this game between Wang Yue and, and John Bartholomew where um, very strong bishop on d5. Yep. A very non-Scandy-ish position. Could that be why it's not so scandalous? Is, did did you just do that? I did. Do I have to acknowledge that? Did. It wasn't good, Danny. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, You've done so much better in the past. You're better than that. You're better than that. You are. That's that's so you it may sound insulting, but I'm really complimenting <laughs> you. Brother. The uh movie 5 is now played on the board and and this is this is going to be John's game to win, which again, against Wang Yue, if you're just joining us, John actually had a great game against Li Chao in round one. Um, was was probably better until time pressure uh, set in and, and, and he, he made a, a dubious exchange sacrifice. But overall, John seems to be playing well right now. So for those of you who are fans of of, uh, of John Bartholomew, he's he seems to be doing well. E5, this... It's hard to imagine him not at least drawing this game right now, Robert. I mean, this bishop is flexing over this knight right now, right? This is how a bishop dominates a knight on the edge of the board, guarding all the light squares. The knight is completely limited. Um, gotta love John's play right now. Yeah, absolutely. His, I mean, he's playing very well, and the results don't show. That's why I never really like box score stats, and we could talk about other sports, but in chess, you see a result. Oh, John lost his first game. It doesn't show how well he played right. because he played an excellent game of chess. And well, his teammates are also doing really well in this match because right. We did see Andrew Tang lose. That's unfortunate. They're down three to two. But if you look at the other boards this round, Zhang Di, um, well, actually now I take it back. Cause I thought that Chris Will Enriquez was doing well before and oh, never mind. Swallowing my words. Teammates not helping him out on that board. Yeah. Take it back. No, it. So this one, is, D. this one is now in the books. Um, Li Chao was moments away from, right, moving moving yeah. things along the H file in uh, in dangerous ways. Um, the other game we haven't looked at though in a while is the one between Henriquez and Zong D. Zong D trying to defend, maybe 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 uh, overly aggressive with G five. No, I think that Black's doing really well here, actually. G5 stopped White from going G5, but look at the queenside pawns, Danny. B3 is hanging. C3 will be but vulnerable. But hold on. What about what about takes and then bishop D4 check? Ah, I didn't realize Black could just bring the bishop right back to F6, and he's just totally fine. Yeah, or even bring my king to G6 and say, you gave me a check, so what? Right. I'm just going to sit sit pretty and win all your queenside pawns. I actually think that Zhang D is the one to be favored here because of that issue on the queenside. You can't even go pawn to B4 hmm. without losing your A3 pawn. This is not looking good for Enriquez. I loved his position earlier, and then it's gone nothing but south. Yeah, and he's uh, he's struggling right now, not just with uh, color choices there in the background of curtains and, and, and shades, but but on the board. Um, Corrales is doing what he's supposed to do in this Berlin, though. I mean, he has been working it now in that obstacle bishop ending you talked about with h5 coming to kick the knight out of g6, something like knight e5 to follow, so... So, okay, yeah, if, no, Cor this... if we're taking stock here, Corrales in good shape. We think Bartholomew's in good shape. Really, this one here where the, again, the, the surprising board four. And some people have asked Robert where this kid came from, right? Obviously, kind of a hand-picked one from Li Chao. Um, but very similar to, to even some states in the U.S. that have their own rating systems, right? That, that, where they play a lot locally but don't always play in National Federation games, USCF games, or even FIDE rated games. The Chinese Chess League is super, super active, and there's been um, a lot of stories like this where you have players that are just way stronger than their FIDE rating, um, and it, it makes them even more dangerous as if they needed help because they're already so top-heavy with grandmasters like Wang Yue and, and you know, Ding Li Ren and all those guys, so tough. Yeah, and, it's, and it seemed like last week they were playing in the same facility, right? They play at Li Chao School of Chess, if I'm not yep. mistaken. yep. So they definitely have a very good training. They allow them to play the Petrov because that's uh, been Li Chao's opening. They've even said that in past interviews. And Zhang Di is very talented, clearly, two and a half to four last week, trying to win this game for the Pandas and send them to San Francisco for the second year in a row. 
Speaking of trying to win the game, Bartholomew just played b5 to kick that knight out of d6, and he's going to play rook d8, I think, to pin the knight. How else is he dealing with the fork? So rook d8, I guess you have to go rook d2, but you're going to suffer in any endgame here. I like where John's taking this game. He has the you know single pair of rooks, yep. just one aside, and that way if they get traded, well, black is the only side with a pass pawn because white's three on two is double G pawns that are totally immobilized. And the E5 pawn at some point will start running, not to mention your queen side pawns, A2 and B3, that Bishop would love to slide into the B1 square and just start tickling those pawns. Yeah, I love it. So the only question is, is he calculating playing Bishop C Ooh, or Rook FA check? I was wondering if he was going to play Bishop C2 first. Now he'll probably bring the Bishop safely back to this diagonal. Um meaning the, the B1, H7 diagonal where it's safe. Uh, Although, Mong is going to be really annoying if you do that and play Knight B7 to C5. So at least, okay, now, okay, he, so he kicked the king over a little bit and then played Rook to D8. So he made that white king one move further away from the queen side. So that's usually a great decision, like a little pendulum move. And so Rook D2 is played, and now he, he gained the tempo, right? The king is on G1 rather than the F file. Yep. So bishop c6 probably. Uh, just I like keeping my bishop on that side of the board. I really don't want to allow knight to b7 to c5 as that hurts my queenside pawns. So bishop c6 covers that very important b7 square. And then I'll put bishop f8 to challenge your knight. I don't think white is doing that badly here. I think there's very good drawing chances. Okay, so you went there. So, But that's, that's an oh. aggressive way. To play the position, and actually, it makes it makes things like bishop f8 even stronger, Robert, because if a3 now there's even this pawn, kind of being spied through the knight, right? So I wonder, yeah, I wonder if he's just going to play bishop c5, like a3, b4, bishop c5, something like that, and just say, if you ever take me on d6, opposite colored bishops, but then black can leave that pin there for a long time. Yeah, and I guess if you're looking at it from an overall match success. Uh, perspective right Bartholomew is the board four for the blizzard so scathing even a half a point from Wang Yue isn't the worst result but I think I think you're not going to get chances like this very often and the reason we like black so much everybody again because you've got pawns split on both sides of the board here and and that usually makes the bishop pair just so much more dynamic um, in terms of what they can do in the open board but as you said Robert if the knight can just Ooh, I was going to say, if the knight is just stuck to d6, then then I guess uh, Wang Yue is okay. And and you think John's just playing for a draw with that move? Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like it. I mean, just now you're opposite colored bishops. You can't play to win this. And I'm trying to think how that affects the team because Chung Yu's up three to two, right? Yeah. And this will make it. Um, three and a half, two and a half. And I'm looking around the other boards. We saw, saw Enriquez was worse. And Corrales is their one hope in this game, and they're an end game, and that's going to be very instructive. Yeah. So as soon as they agree to a draw in this game between Bartholomew and Wang Yue, we can probably head right there because this is just a clear draw. Well, let's go check out that game because this game between Bartholomew and Wang Yue is going to be a draw. Obscode Bishops, uh, we can talk a little bit about why for those of you who don't understand. In fact, I guess we'll just do that real quick because they did just agree to a draw. The reason is that both sides will sit on their own color square, so... Black sits uh, on the light squares, white sits on the dark squares, and there's just no direct way for the bishops to ever challenge each other, which is why so many of these obstacle bishop endings without either a significant material advantage or some other creative way to, to, to access targets or weaknesses or other pieces on the board, they're very, very often drawn endgames, and um, that's that. But here we have a different dynamic. We have a bishop versus a knight. One that Corrales can can be the only one who who wins, but you ha you got to hand it to Zhao Jun, who's been defending a bad Berlin for a long time, right? And seems to be seems to be closing closing in on a draw. Yeah, because now it's all locked up, right? How is that king going to get in the position yeah. for Fidel Corrales? It's not. And if you ever go bishop to b8, I can always go knight c6, protecting my a7 pawn and attacking your bishop. So that's the one thing that White wanted to do is get the king very active, but now it's not working out. I see Wesley so. <laughs> in the game chat he's been there all game let's go corrales for the win draw most likely and like suggesting moves and stuff so it's always nice to see wesley um wesley's hanging yeah. out uh, for those of you who don't know he's uh 
friends with a lot of the uh, Webster or former Webster students. We showed an image earlier in the show where Corrales said that his, uh, one of his greatest non-chess accomplishments was graduating Webster University. Unfortunately, Webster maybe needed him as they are now uh, home. If you just got here, they actually lost earlier in today's show to the St. Louis Archbishops, um, who will be going to the live final in San Francisco after they beat the Webster Windmills. But uh, Wesley So helped eliminate Webster on behalf of the Archbishops, and now he's hanging out to root for his uh, his friends in Minnesota. And, and for those of you who don't know, Wesley um, actually played for the Minnesota Blizzard in the inaugural Pro Chess League season. In 2017, he wasn't playing for the Archbishops. He was actually playing uh, for the, the Blizzard, if I remember correctly. Am I right about that? No, I'm wrong about that. I think, wait, I thought he played for the Blizzard. I think you might be right. Are, are you right? Am I, I right? Know. He played... Wait, he played for no, the no, he actually won the MVP for the Bishops. I corrected myself before you could, Greg. Yeah, stay out of it, Greg. This isn't your fight, Greg. Oh, I played for Minnesota in the U.S. Chess ah, that's so was... I wasn't totally crazy, but I was wrong. Greg, this isn't your fight. Yeah, he's so protective of his PCL Yeah, but no, as I was saying it, you could hear me like I was like, wait, because actually Wesley So, Wesley So won the MVP. In the first year of the of the Pro Chess League over Magnus Carlsen in 2017. That's right. Yep. And was he still going in the chat, by the way? I just see him yep. talking to people who are asking him random questions. So it's really nice to see that. He's a very supportive teammate and, of course, a world top player. Yep. All right. Well, uh, Wesley, so talk aside, we, uh, we have another draw in the books. And uh, with it, the Shangdu Pandas will take a one-game lead into round three. Uh, we will be back in just a few moments to see exactly what the second half of today's action is going to bring us. Don't go anywhere in this super close match. The 2019 Pro Chess League playoff rolls on. When we return, game round three begins. And if you're just getting here, we are now joined by one of the members of the St. Louis Archbishops who played for Played for the Bishops in three matches this year and uh, is also a very well-known streamer to the uh, Twitch community known as Last Seven Samurai. But JJ, your team is successful. They are heading to San Francisco for the live final. Will you be there? That's right. Um, I'm hoping to be there, first of all, because I don't really know if I'm in the roster at the moment or not. Uh, the It will be decided by Mike Comer, and I'm pretty sure he's planning out on what lineup to choose, what is the best lineup to represent the team in the finals, and I'll hope that I'll be one of the players. Yeah, you, you, you have to go with a different lineup this time around. We talked to Alejandro Ramirez about that because Wesley So has other obligations. So how do you think that impacts your team? Because you had that very potent one-two punch with Fabiano and Wesley. What are your thoughts about that impact on your team for the playoffs? Well, Wesley is definitely the, one of the key players. Um, he has led the team so many times. So we will definitely be missing him, but I'm pretty sure the team will do its best no matter what, and we will try to do our best to win the tournament again. It's not 100% confirmed that Wesley won't be there. He could fly direct from San Francisco to Africa. To Abidjan, Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire from hey, San Francisco. Hey, they offer a direct uh, flight these days on uh, Air Lingus. That sounds like you just made that yep. up. Um, <laughs> what I didn't make up, though, is, uh, is is a difficult situation that the Blizzard are faced with. And, and uh, JJ, talk a little bit about how you look at this matchup. If you've been, been following the action, the Pandas are up by one game. And we know that they're um, obviously a powerhouse who – was was competing in San Francisco last year. Uh, what do you put yourself in, in the shoes of a Minnesota player here? What what's your mindset right now going into the the back half of this match? Correct. So the Blizzards do have the drawing odds apparently, as far as I got informed by the chat when the match started. So that's pretty good for the Blizzards, but obviously they have to try to get those points, which is not easy against the Pandas so far. Uh, the Pandas are somewhat controlling the game, although there were a few upsets, especially in the round one, I believe. But I still see the Pandas as the favorite. 
although I would also prefer, as my coach Alejandro said, that uh, the Blizzards would be a better pick for us in terms of playing in the finals. But yeah, we will see how this goes. There is still a lot of games to be played, and both sides have to do their best and win the games. Or You said Alejandro's your coach, and that's at St. Louis University. That's right. Which is kind of a rival developing between St. Louis and Webster as well? Yeah, in terms of uh, all sorts of grounds, let's say, the Pro Chess League, the Collegiate Chess, and I think many other fields. Got it. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to let you honestly deal with the poltergeist behind you that's constantly trying to jump through the screen and, and get at us. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a, um, I don't know if you know, there's, there was a young blonde girl that was taken into the TV in, 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 a, in a very um, difficult situation in, in, in a movie, Poltergeist. When did she become, when did she become blonde? <gasps> the girl in the, in the movie, Poltergeist. Oh, I did you know Samara from No, 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 I was talking about, dude, I'm talking about Poltergeist. You ever seen, My JJ? Bad. I was just, you ever seen I Poltergeist? I have seen, I was just half listening to you, I'm going to be honest. JJ, have you ever seen Poltergeist? No. <laughs> You're about Ooh. to see one behind you here as soon as we <laughs> – no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, the, uh, JJ, seriously, though, this is uh, – it's it's uh, been nice to get your thoughts on it. And, and, of course, congratulations to the Archbishops. And we hope to see you in San Francisco, maybe if not as a player, but as a fan and a Twitch streamer there. Um, just saying. Yeah, hopefully I can make it because I would love to see the uh, live action and also be a part of everything. So, yeah. Yep. Well, ditto, my man. All right. Um, we're gonna we're gonna uh let you let you get back to it, and uh, Rob and I are gonna dive in here as uh, round three takes off, uh, between the pandas and the blizzard. Thanks for joining us. Sounds good. Good luck, and I'll be watching the show. See you. All right. Thanks, JJ. Hey, Danny. Yo. You know why I missed your reference? Why? Because I was looking at the game between Andrew Tang and Zhang Di, and on move nine, when Zhang Di went bishop d three. Tank could have won a piece by simply capturing on d3 and playing to a pawn to g5. You've got to be kidding me. I'm not kidding you at all. Like, 0% joke in that. Well, first of all, just because you missed my pop culture reference to Poltergeist doesn't mean you have to make excuses. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to make it all better. Um, but you are right that Andrew Tang missed a piece here. That is, oh, that's so painful if you're, uh, if you're a Blizzards fan. Bishop takes g6 and then g5. And these these are the kind of tactics that even strong players miss in the opening because it's just not something you're expecting, right? You're not intuitively looking. And I think um, in some other principled fashions, bishop takes d3 would be a mistake. Black shouldn't be voluntarily trading on d3 to help this queen come out, right? Your, your whole goal is to kind of just sort of stare down, you know, this trade here and, and, and try to make make white take so that you can capture and open the H file for an attack on the king. I'm just sort of, I'm not defending Andrew's blunder, but I'm explaining it to the fans who I think wonder sometimes how grandmasters miss those moves. And it's because tactically, you know, it, this doesn't normally happen in the opening where someone blunders a piece and strategically you're actually hoping white takes here to open your H file. So again, uh, shocking, but yeah, Robert, that's a pretty nice find by you. Tang well, I'm with you, except for the fact that he spent a minute and six seconds on the move. Like, if he was playing instantly, I'm totally with you. You don't want to take on D3. As you said, it gives the queen axe to D3 square, gives you the F5 square. Yep. But he spent a minute, right? Like, what were you thinking about in that minute? Because you know you're not going to take that piece. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not certain. I think he's not having his best chest today. We saw a great position in the first game where he blundered a full rook. Yeah. Last game wasn't so great. Granted, he's playing some very strong players. But he's not on his A game because we know how strong Andrew Tang is when he's playing his best chess. It might be the robe, honestly. It might be the robe. <laughs> so we'll we'll ask him about it perhaps another time. But yeah, as Robert said, it's really that Black took a whole minute here and still missed this opportunity to win a piece. But okay, he should win this game anyway against the board four for the Pandas. So we'll see if he can figure things out. That Bishop on F4 still looks awkward, to be frank, and, and maybe... Maybe maybe Andrew can take advantage of the e3 pawn with some idea of the knight coming to h5 at some point to hit the bishop. So, all right, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, hopefully, JJ survived his poltergeist. Maybe you can let us know that you're alive in the chat, buddy. Appreciate it, just because some people are worried. Um, I'll tell you who else is worried. 
Li Chao about his king on f8. Although maybe not so much now that he's got this clear road to play king f7 on the next move. What happened in this opening? A Karo Khan yeah. gone crazy. Well, it's not even the craziest Karo Khan of the round. We'll see a different Karo Khan that was even more crazy. But it looks like black got very aggressive. Li Chao was going for a kingside yep. thrust over there. And, yep. well, white sort of ignored it, said, please put your pawn in h4 because that pawn has ex overextended itself. It will become a target. And now with the king on f7, yes, black has protected the e6 pawn, the g6 square in case there's uh, the thought of playing knight f4 to g6. But, yeah, look at white's position. You have a like a just stranglehold yep. over the position. You might move your king away to h1 or h probably h1, play knight g1 to f3. And I don't know. It looks to me. I, I also C like Enrique's position, although. There it is. Yeah, that knight is better. Knight e1, knight f3. Same idea, but with the, the knight that wasn't doing anything. This is a yeah. very smart play by Enrique. Knight e1, knight f3, h4 is a target. There's even tactics on this king on the f file here. Some sort of discoveries at some point. Um, wow. So uh, a difficult position here for the 2700 Grandmaster Manager dual roles uh we haven't checked on john bartholomew or um let's see um or wang wang ua's game so we keep an eye on both let's let's check out what's going on in john bartholomew's game here against chess fat bear again oh no i know what opening it was that's for sure it's team scandy team scandy back at it again with the remix wicka wicka um I don't know bum, bum. where that came from, but uh, I think John was uh, very successful in the last round, uh, a game that he drew pretty much with ease and, and was uh, certainly better with Black at some point. This is back to uh, his his roots, very traditional-looking Scandinavian position here, everybody. The queen loses time in exchange for opening the D-file, having a, a potentially very solid structure for the rest of the game, and and look for John to maybe move one of these pawns. The reason you might move the C pawn is to play something like B6 and open the bishop this way. Maybe the E pawn uh, to open the bishop to the more traditional H3, C8 diagonal, and then try to use the center after that. So, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's a solid position in the Scandi. And, and frankly, as much as we um, sort of say what we, we say about the Scandi not being the, the most aggressive opening for black, this hasn't been the most aggressive line for white, Robert. Zhao Jun played the D3 Scandi. Normally... As Uncle Yermo once told me, the problem with the pawn on d3 is that it belongs on d4. I agree with Yermo, and I was going to say that also this knight on g3 belongs on f3. Like, what's that knight doing on g3? Yeah. You better go knight e4, because otherwise your knight's really... The pawn on e6 and the pawn on g6 totally dominate this knight, so you might as well go trade on e4 for a more active piece that's not on f6. So I agree with you. This was not the most challenging line that John Bartholomew could have faced, and well, now he just pushes pawn to b6. I would, I like bishop f4 because e5 is not what you want to play yep. now that you played b6. And look at the a2 bishop. If you play e5, my bishop has new life, and the f7 pawn will forever be a target. Ooh, so, yeah, yeah, interesting, creative way to poke at the structure, try to get it to expand. Um, now the bishop can even go to g5 and try to induce h6 and then go back to d2, which again is kind of inducing a new pawn weakness on h6, but also a pawn weakness on g6 because the f7 yep. pawn is pinned, so you have to watch out for tactics. I tend to agree with you, and I was criticizing White's approach against the Scandinavian here, but but now I wonder if uh, if b6 was not ideal because it's partly why Black had to play e5, right, Robert? Because b6 kind of weakened the, B7, uh, the c6 pawn, so... Sort of a unique, uh, a unique position developing here. Not your traditional Scandinavian structure. No, and I, one of the, another idea that I would say White has going for him is h4 to h5, and just trying to create some problems for Black on the king side. Yep. Because right now the bishop on a2 is beautiful, and by playing for h4 h5 at the right moment, you just really challenge Black setup because you fianchettoed. So, it, so a word of advice that I would suggest is whenever I see in Fianchetto, I don't always play h4, h5, but I always consider that idea because I can chisel at it. The pawn on g6 is what we call a hook, right? We always talk about this. And so when I push my pawn forward, I'm already threatening something. Not to mention you can play h4, h5, h6, all the way to further restrict Black's pieces. Well, I don't always attack the king's side either, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. Um <laughs> You are the most interesting man. Let's check on Corrales' game with Wang Yue because it's the only one we haven't looked at. Sort of rightfully uh, so at first. It was a super weird closed structure. Um, but now it's 
Now it's heating up a little bit. We've got the G file for white combined with uh, some C file action for black, right? To each his own. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what white's plan is because isn't black playing rook c6 to go rook h to c8 next and um, then play like go, go full seam ahead on the queen side? So actually, I don't know what you're going to do as white. I'm really nervous for Fidel Corrales here that he sacrificed a pawn. So if he wants to win it back, he has to go rook h to g1, but it's time consuming. He used to go c3 here to protect the c2. Okay, well, this is just a very passive setup. Yeah. I mean, he didn't go c3, Danny, because a5, b4 would just crack the position open anyway. Yeah. And very importantly, this knight on f5 is the best piece on the board. It protects g7, so even if you get double rooks and take on g6, you're not getting g7. And it attacks h4. It puts pressure on d4. If your bishop moves from f2, it can go to e3. So, I mean, to me, it's just an amazing position for Wang Yue. I would put my other knight in, knight b6 to c4 right now. You can't go b3 to keep my knight out because then your a3 pawn hangs. This is all Wang Yue in this one. Wow, you painted a pretty bleak picture there. Uh, but Grandmaster Wesley So in the chess.com chat agrees with you. He said White's I just see, I see that now. White's, White's position, position is awful. awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. hey, I, uh, I'm glad you don't hold your words. You know who else doesn't hold his words? International Master Levy Rosman, who right after this show is going to be holding the post-match coverage. So for any of you who are tuning in right now and wondering, hey, this show's been going for like, do some uptime command. I think it's been going for like six hours or something. I missed all the highlights from earlier. Well, Levy's got your back. That's what he does. He'll be doing it at twitch.tv slash Pro Chess League, which you should give that channel a follow because a lot more Pro Chess League coverage to come with our first ever Summer League, which is coming up. Uh, we'll, make, we'll have some announcements about that very soon, probably in our in our next uh, playoff uh, coverage on April 2nd. So uh, anyway, make sure you stick around after this and head over to Levy Rosman's channel as he provides a breakdown of the, the biggest moments of the day. Yeah, Levy does great work there, giving you all the coverage that you might have missed. I don't know what you're doing if you missed the pro chess. I know. Some people day, aren't but... watching us all the time, Robert. <laughs> well, we all make mistakes. Right? Just some of us make them more than others. Right. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, uh oh. Speaking... Who are you owing for? Speaking of for... mistakes. What, what happened? Looking at this game here, Jin Zong D and Penguin GM. Knight g4 uh -oh. hangs the f7 pawn with check. What is going on here? I don't know. Cannot compute. Wait, wait. So e3 is hanging next. Yeah. And queen h4 is a threat as well. And if you, yeah, so if you move the bishop, let's just get freaky in this and show people what happens on like knight f3, double check, double kill. The king moves, and then you play something like queen h4. <laughs> Yeah, it's just and going for a direct mating attack. You can't take both knights at once. So even on h3, queen takes g3, you can't take both these knights, and they both allow the queen to play to h2 with checkmate. That's uh, that's one version of how this ends, right? You can find the alternate ending if you buy the uh, extended edition. So Yeah, so how do you defend? I mean, you can't move this bishop know. away. Yep. If you take on d4... Then black will just take back on d4, and for king h1, you have queen h4. Like the same exact checkmate we were talking about, where you're attacking the pawn h2. If you go h3, I simply pick up your knight on g3. And well, the reason that, well, why that works. Show them all the way. If they take g4, you go back to h4 and deliver checkmate on the h file, because now the bishop guards g1. Exactly. So in the live position, because that doesn't work, I think you have to make some kind of sacrificial, like knight to h5, threatening checkmate on g7. And if you take on h5... Then I have queen takes h5 check back, hitting your knight on g4. So I actually think that maybe king h8 was better than king h7. Wow. Because putting your king on h7, um, I think, puts you a little bit more in harm's way. I Maybe king h8, knight h5 was still a plan. But then there was, then there was, I don't know. Maybe there still was. And then there nice was a mate threat on g7 uh, uh, that maybe you have to stop with something like rook g8 just to keep your whole idea of this bishop hanging and the queen h4 threats alive. Yeah, maybe. I mean, rook g8 actually might be a way to deal with your whole idea to begin with, even if knight h5 is played in the live position. But, but then knight f4 comes in. Like, I'm I'm getting a pretty quick attack yeah, over there on the king. Are you mating way. me there if I take? Okay, if I take e3, you're mating me. Queen takes g6 and queen h5. Bob's your uncle. Um, yep. 
but I have queen d6 maybe guarding g6. The e3 bishop is still hanging. But then I can take your knight on d4 finally. Right. You move the king with so check, I... and I'm not I'm not getting queen h4 anymore. I see. It's like it's a very complicated position, but it looks like white is at least hanging in the game. It might be losing, right? It still might be losing. Yeah. But at least you're fighting on. You're living to see another Living move. to see another day, as they say. Okay, this is going to be a crazy finish, so we'll definitely keep our eye on it. Obviously, uh, this is Andrew Tang's opportunity to get on the board if you're just joining us. Uh, having a bit of a tough day right now, the Penguin GM down down 0-2, but this is where he's supposed to start scoring for his team, um, starting with his matchup versus the board four from Shangdu. Um, the game between Lee Chow and Henriquez is, is interesting. We have this knight versus bishop in balance. White's got pressure on things like g6 and e6. The problem is, whoa, is he sacking? He did it. I was going to say, I was just about to say the problem is you can't do anything about it right now. Well, he just proved me wrong. Snap. Whoa. Wait, so what did you just take? Look at <laughs> Lee Chow is also like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he believes it either. F5, and he's like, uh... He moved his king away. But I first, that looked like, <laughs> you know what that looked like, Danny? What? It looked like an oh bleep moment. Yeah, it looked like a, like, oh, did I just miss that? Right. And then it's like, a, oh, wait a second. That's not that bad. This actually works out for me. <laughs> He's like, all right, what? That's <laughs> Queen g3 in the live position. Your king's actually quite safe on h6, yeah. thanks to those knight on h5. So you're simply of a piece in many lines. But white has captured two pawns for that knight. And so the b6 pawn is a target. The d5 pawn is a target. Maybe white is getting enough compensation for the material, but I, I think queen g3 here is the move to make because by playing queen to g3, you're of course offering the queen trade and you get into an end game where only black can win, yep. despite the fact that white will get some pawns. Ooh. And if you don't. But he hangs f6 now. Wait. Is oh, it he rook went... takes f6? Because, okay, everybody, the knight can't take, the queen falls, and if the king moves, now you. King g5. He's going king g5. He's a brave soul. Whoa. He's already done it. Oh, no, he didn't. He's going to put the king on g5. Now he's done it. Wow. That's some brave stuff. That is. That's accurate calculation, Holmes. Yeah, I, I liked my queen on g3 because it was defended another time there. You know, I didn't have to worry about this. But I guess he said, my king's going and taking your f5 pawns. So you have rook g6 check. Give me another check. I'm just going to simply grab that pawn off f5. And by the way, Andrew Tang has won his Indeed. game. Indeed. Let's see how that time. finished, by the way, because in the position we left, unfortunately, Zong D did not find Robert's creative knight h5 ID. I'm not sure what a computer would say about it, but Robert and I don't operate in the world of concretes, okay? We operate in the world of, I got checkmate threats on h2, and you're going to resign. Yeah, it's pretty direct attack yeah, there. And... Your knight h5 idea was super creative, and I do think it's instructive for the fans, regardless of the fact that Zong D didn't find it. Because, you know, when you're in a position with these types of threats of mating nets, you have to start considering outside the box moves like that. And yeah, what a... I was going to say, Danny, the reason I thought about it is because my position looks so bad from from the white pieces there. Then, like, how do I get something exactly. that lets me start? <clears throat> yeah. It's process of elimination more than anything. No, but you're right. I think sometimes uh, the the most brilliant or most resourceful defensive ideas come up with when, like you said, you kind of acknowledge, like, I don't know what else to do, so you force yourself to think like that. And I think sometimes sometimes players are hesitant to consider moves like that. Um, so instructive, something Zong D missed, but either way, the wiz uh, not the wizards, the blizzard have tied it up. You're a blizzard, Harry. Yo, oh, blizzard, wait. Harry. Yo, blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work. Well, you, well, the blizzards are not doing work. Your blizzard, this. Harry. There's a storm moving in from the northwest. Your blizzard. <laughs> You're ridiculous. <laughs> we're on uh, we're on Zhao Jun's game with John Bartholomew. Good news okay. for Team Scandy. Black is still slightly worse, which is where you always want to be. <laughs> yep. And the I get so coming. much hate for my truthful hate on dubious openings that willingly take on a bad position. What is it with people? You know. Yeah, I mean, you just showed JJ that in the French defense, well, it's just kind of 1-0 there. If you, can, if you can lose a match to Danny Wrench, you must be doing something wrong, okay? Uh, John is, uh, that didn't look like Starbucks coffee to me. That looked like a little bit of relax my nerves drink. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see and ask him later, especially if the Blizzard win. If they prove to be wizards uh, magical in the snow, we'll see, if they can, uh, we'll see if he can provide a little insight to what's actually in that cup. 
I think he's talked about how he just goes to Starbucks because they give you some kind of membership thing. So I pay attention to you, John Bartholomew. I listen. <laughs> yeah, if John doesn't get sponsored by Starbucks, they are missing out. That guy is, uh, I mean, he's a walking Starbucks commercial. Um. Anyway, I, but... I, I don't know how to follow that up. I'm like, Starbucks has so many people that they can endorse. Yeah, but chess is up. happening right now. Did you not see? We have 6,100 people on Twitch right now. By the way, shout out to everybody that's with us. We got all of our mods. We got Dr. Dragon Nitsky. I saw earlier we had Face Chess here. There he is. We got Chess Bay here. I think I saw Chess Bay. Can I just say that we have not acknowledged everybody here in a while? And I love you all so much. Seriously, this is a great time. We got 6,000 people. Give us some hype. Give me your Blizzard love or give me your Panda love. If you're from, Ch if you're watching this from China, first of all, you're using a VPN and those are illegal. Second of all, thanks for being here. <laughs> well, I mean, Li Chao, what he's, I don't know what he's using, but I know his position is cruising. I guess I was throwing a rhyme there because look at this position, Danny. Li Chao has traded the queens off. That king on h1 might get checkmated soon, honestly, with that king on f5 can run into f4 right. and things like that. Yeah. Actually, there's a quick mate. Knight takes h3, threatening knight f2 check, pawn to h3, rook d2. Oh, that's, that's usually something the bishop helps create. That's creative. He goes for it. He sees it, dude. Shout out to Easy. Yep. Easy Rider there with the tier one sub. We really appreciate it. Wow. And he just resigned. Let me show everybody the mate that Robert called for because it's an instructive net. After rook b5, knight f2 check, the king comes up h3, and there's no way to stop rook g2 on the next move. Okay, you can give a check for a couple moves if you want, but eventually the goods will be delivered. The eagle will land. Nice find, Robert. All right, well, the uh, pandas regained the lead. The game we haven't looked at in a while is Corrales versus Wong, Wong Yue. Um, yeah, um, you highlighted a really interesting point earlier, Robert, that the knight on f5 was so crucial to guarding the pawn on g7. And I think that was something I, I misunderstood. Um, I know that's shocking to the world that I'm uh, not as strong of a chess player as you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but it, it is, uh, it's is—it's not shocking to me. But it's really important, I think, to see the bigger picture, the forest through the trees, as Robert pointed out. And Wesley So was saying the position is so bad for white because black's weaknesses, everybody, were never going to be as, as weak as white's because this knight on f5 was just already holding the whole thing together. And there's no way white white really needed Robert like to move the knight from f3 to e3 to make a trade, right? And there's just no way yeah. to do that. And so black was just always in complete control and developed this whole attack, just as you said, with a5 and b4. And now White just had to give up the exchange. So Wang Yue is cruising, and probably the Pandas are going to take a two-game lead into the last round. Yeah, and the problem with the light squares, right? There was no light square bishop. You put your White early on when committed this pawn structure. But look at all the dark square pawns. So when yep. you have all your pawns in dark squares, pawns capture diagonally, which means the light squares are not defended very well. So this 9 out of 5 is a beautiful piece. Um, let's see how Wang Yue finishes it off. White has a, what, one pawn and a knight for the rook. So it's not enough compensation, particularly because, well, look at Wang Ye's move. He's going to go B4, try to go Rook C1 with check, yep. and try to just go forward with an attack. He's also pointing out to everybody how quickly you should be aggressive when you, uh, when, as soon as you have a different piece dynamic, like an exchange is just a Rook for a minor piece, right? But there's the same amount of pieces on the board. It's just that you have a Rook and they have a Knight. So what do Rooks want that Knights don't? They want open files. And you don't want to hold on to material uh, to worry, uh, to worry about, uh, you don't want to worry about material versus making sure the position helps your pieces. And b5 and b4, even if white takes b5, is not something he's worried about because now he's got his rooks getting jiggy with it on the open lines, and and that's exactly where they want to be here. So, again, I just find it instructive how quickly they they use uh, they use tactics to make sure that their pieces have the have the best possible uh, positions. And this is. Um, People sometimes worry too much about material count uh, instead of getting the type of position that your pieces will thrive in. It's why you can sometimes give up a rook for a bishop if you can attack on, on let's say, the color squares of a bishop, the light squares, just to be abstract. And here, and here black is just going to be super aggressive and, and blow the door open on the C file. Yeah, this game does not look like it's going well for Corral. I mean, it's just not going well, to be matter of fact. And the game between Bartholomew is also not going very well for the Blizzards. So... Um, it's an unfortunate situation for them. In fact, if they lose both these games, they'll be on seven and a half, four and a half. So they have the draws, but they'll need 
three and a half out of four. Okay, so it's... this one here is really tough for John, I guess mainly because these tactics on F7 are just unstoppable. Yeah, I would chop this knight on E3 just so you don't fork me on C2, which is looking kind of annoying. Classic and fork then... emote. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to take that off the board, and then I'm going to play... I don't know what I take on F7 with. All look good. I'll probably take with my bishop on F7, and if you take on F7 with your rook, you're just down some material. If you take if you move your king over, then I'll start gobbling all your pawns. I think I take this pawn G6, take the pawn H5 after that, and your king's not safe either. Yeah, it just looks like too much free stuff for Jajun, for John Bartholomew to survive a position like this. But maybe he has chances that I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying, I, I'm going to sit back and try to give him a fair shake. I think objectively the position is not good, but um, wow, that move. I don't love as much because knight C to D5 to block that bishop on A2. So I now I think actually John may be able to at least try to survive here. Once you block that bishop, you're thinking about sacrificing on – well, not sacrifice. You have rook takes F7 to get two knights yeah. for the rook. And you're still you're threatening also, knight takes C2. Exactly. Renewing that threat knight takes C2. So, Well, maybe John I will guess, find knight C to D5 here. I don't see another. I mean, taking on C2 is possible, but there are so many discovered checks in the position that I don't think I could ever play that move. Uh, I think knight C D5 is just like block that bishop. That's all you that's all you want to do. And you know, John really needs to somehow fight back and win this game. He really needs this one. Yeah, no, the team needs it. This is this is a uh, okay, and he finds it. Knight C to D5. It's uh it's resting on on the shoulders. Shoulders of John Bartholomew right now. Yep. And now it's getting complicated. And we've seen Zhao Jun get into time trouble in other games. In the first round, he dropped under like one second a couple times. He lost that game. But he needs to keep his composure and play relatively quickly. Don't just blitz it out because, yep. you know, then you blunder. But here, already the position is very tough. Like I said, I would probably take this knight on E3 because I don't like the prospect of knight takes C2 looming but even there as we're talking about d takes e3 for black that bishop on g7 has new life in the position rook takes f7 is a threat as mentioned yeah i, I like it Whew. it's getting getting interesting yeah we just have these two games left here and okay maybe they maybe somehow minnesota can survive both they need that yeah uh, and, surprisingly in the game uh between corrales and wang yue right as we left it Wang Yue made the decision to sacrifice the exchange right back. I mean, okay, maybe it's not a surprise. Honestly, the more you look at this position, this just looks, it frankly looks awful for White. I mean, like, uh, the D4 pawn is under fire. The rook can now move to F3. He plays it before I can highlight it. Here comes B3, and the D4 pawn falls. Um, yeah. Okay, so probably, okay, He and he indeed goes for that. So let's go right back to John Bartholomew over here. Um, unfortunately, that, again, if you're a Blizzard fan, looks like it's getting closer to a panda victory. Um, but, you know, John found the move you suggested, Robert, and now time is ticking, actually, for Zhao Xun. I mean, this is... Whoa! C4! Not expected. What? What How does that really that? help White? Okay, so... <laughs> I... Do we take on Passant? But that okay, you sacrifice the E3 bishop, but you take B2 with tempo. And then you could even take e3 and laugh in the face of danger of the discovered check. Possibly. Wait, so what What if I go rook? Instead of rook to b1, can I go rook to d1? That way I stop your bishop d4 ideas that I know uh, you're Okay, to... so rook d1, and the point is now on takes, I can take back safely because there's no uh, pin, everybody. But, um, okay. But it was worth a shot. I tried. Um, yeah, and still... No, nah, then I think that saves the day. Wow, what a but, okay. What a wild <laughs> move, though. Extremely wild. I, I I'm like trying to figure this out because they're also in that line, Dan. You were just mentioning like D takes C three. Maybe after Bishop takes E three, then you take on F seven and say, "Look, I know my position's slightly worse, right? But I have some chances in this imbalance end game." White, White uh, like probably the... takes d5 there and takes f7. But the question, I think the real question about whether that line works, Robert, is whether you can take on b2 with tempo before regaining the knight. I think if Black can get away with that, it's a, it's a, it's it's real compensation. What do you think? Yeah, no, ah, definitely. Ah, but he didn't do it. 
And I actually kind of like what he did as well. Night of four saying that, well, if you have to do something that's diagonal, I don't believe you can sit and wait. Yeah. G2 pawn is hanging. Knight D3 is a new threat. Pawn to C5 for black shuts down this bishop on A2. So a move like knight to G5, it just feels very slow. Black goes C5. And he went rook takes Wow, e rook takes I'll tell you what, if John pulls this off, Team Scandi is going to go nuts in the chat. Um, yeah, but I promise you it was not because of the Scandinavian opening. Hey. <laughs> don't tell John Bartholomew so, what he can't do. I No, he does what he wants, and he's playing a pretty interesting game right now. But what this is a critical moment. A, white just sacrificed a rook for a knight and a pawn. But this bishop on a2 is still about Looming, to break open with pawn say. and c5. Yeah. Uh, if you this knight f4 is hanging, so clear issues for black to deal with here. Yep. Can and you and deal with it fast. D4? I was gonna say, can you play? Ah, oh, you can't do it. I wanted to play c5 and just be equal, so I could take everything back on f7. But at the end of the line, the rook hangs on b8. Yeah. Um, I, if you're if you're in black's corner, okay, that tactic didn't work, everybody. But if black could just simplify out and trade off both these knights. For, for both the rook on f8 and the knight on f4, black would be very happy in that end game. You've got this you've got this bishop over here um, pointing at, at b2. You would totally take an end game with a rook and two bishop versus rook and two bishops if you could just do it. Wh well, he he's played taking taking this pawn off the board, and I see in the chat people were saying I was suggesting bishop d4, but actually their line's even better. Taking on b2 first and then playing for bishop d4 after. Oh, very d1. nice, actually. Now he's got bishop d4, and if he takes it to four key mode, oh my god, he sees it. John, John found is it. A genius right now. He is Look doing at everything. It. He's doing the confident right. John nod. Yeah, that's that the is. confident John yeah. shuffle of a man with perfectly trimmed facial hair. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh... He is doing work right now. I mean, everything's turned around in his favor. Yeah. So it looked really awful for him before, but the dynamics have favored him. I think Zhao Jun has not been playing his best chess today. And C5, King G7, just get out of this discovery. King G7, Look get out of the pin and don't think twice. Yeah, I would move that. I don't know what he's thinking about. Is there enough? Maybe King H. No, but why would you go King H7? Because then Knight G5 comes in with check. Yeah, okay. no, he just does it. Yeah, perfect. Um, and yeah, no, you're right. Zhao Jun lost earlier to Henriquez and. Um, you know, this is a a huge moment. This is going to keep the Blizzard in the match, um, to be totally frank. And although they are, I think, currently down actually two games, the scoreboard hasn't quite been updated yet, but uh, they uh, they did indeed lose the game that we left behind, if you're wondering. Wang Yue converted on this one right here over Grandmaster Corrales. So it's all down to John here in regards to... Uh, to whether the Blizzard, frankly, keep this close headed into the last the last set of games. And here, don't get don't take this pawn on b6, because rook takes b6, bishop a8, it immediately trades the rooks off the board for black, because the rook would come to b2 to a check if you Boom. get out of the uh, attack. Yep. So play the move rook to e1. There it there is. There it is. The he great found move it. By Zhao Zhu, playing for activity here. If that rook lands on e7, the king is on g7, feels very vulnerable. Your king goes to f6, then I have ideas with knight to g5, throwing knight h7, yeah. fork down. And it's just getting very complicated. Yeah, you can get mated there. You got to be super careful. I think the probably like the best move, move here, Robert, on. might be even be knight f five. If you can get off a pair yeah. of knights, because if knight takes takes and then rook e seven, now you have king f six with tempo, and you can slowly work your way out. That's true. That's very true. So, and so maybe knight f five simplifies at least a pair but, of the knights. Maybe knight f5, I have knight g5. Because if you take my knight on d6, I still have rook e seven check ideas, and that king is might get checkmated. Yeah, you have to be. Wow, what an intense game! And he's now he's almost even on time here. Bartholomew is the the fate of the blizzard. Frankly, this is this is whether the last round matters. If we're just totally honest, going down three games to the pandas probably insurmountable. But um, yeah, but he this should get this game. He moment. should get this win here. And Team Scandi would go wild. So knight g five. Just put in. Okay, rookie seven, seven first, first king of six. Don't get mated. You mentioned this exact point, Danny. This is why I thought he should have went knight g5 first to land rookie seven with a check. Just having that as an, a check rather than just under yeah, attack. But he would still be has knight f5 coming. And now. Yeah, knight f5. And where does this rook go? If you take on b7, then rook takes b7, knight takes b7, the f7, knight. Yep. Oh, it's. Is it. I guess I would take it and enter it. Oh, he backs up, but that's going to. Okay. Oh, but he's got a trick. If you play knight f5 now, then e6 is unguarded. The rook comes back to e6 with check. 
Right. So he's, he's keeping the e file. Yeah, John sees it. He moves the bishop around. He either wants the bishop to come to d7 to guard e6 so he can go for knight f5. Um, well, knight g5 threatens knight h7 oh, check. He just, so. Oh my gosh, he just lost on time. He, oh, no we way. get the fist pump. The Scandi no fist way. pump. Yes. <laughs> he does it. Oh. He gives the fans what he wants. And I am, oh my I am so excited right now that I am not on camera. Um, John Bartholomew. John Bartholomew coming through in the clutch for Minnesota. Keeps this thing close as we head into the last round of games here in the Pacific Division quarterfinals. Wow, what a huge win right there. Honestly, I'm going to chalk that up a little bit to karma because John has been playing so well today. Yeah. And he just got his... Uh, to one and a half points, or he lost that first game that we thought he was playing well. He drew the second game, but he was better the whole way. So he deserved more points than he had. In this particular game, he was in huge trouble. Yeah. It was still tactical. It was dynamic. It wasn't so clear cut, but John knows he was in trouble. I think if you ask him, he wouldn't deny it. Yep. He would just do it freely. But he's been playing such good chess. He's been fighting, showing off his defensive technique, and he deserved this win based on how he played. Yep. Well, you'll chalk that one up to karma. We're going to chalk this one up to it all comes down to the last set of games. We're going to take one very, very quick break, everybody. Uh, don't go anywhere. When we return, the last round of play to decide who goes to San Francisco to the, to the live finale from the Pacific Division when we get back. Queen of one. Queen. It was the queen. Oh my yep. god. That was amazing. I, I, oh, you know I always laugh with the Pokemon. <laughs> We're on top of punching Zavin. So cool. knocking over cameras. Dude, it's like pay attention to your surroundings. Somebody, yep. somebody's cheering for me after winning a chance. It's honestly one of my favorite moments. He actually had great reflexes there. That is how that is how the live final was won last year by the Armenian Eagles. We'll be playing on April 2nd. If they can head back to San Francisco. Um, so, but uh, for those of you wondering whether it matters to these teams to make it to the final, there you go. Right now, it's all on the line between the Xiangdu Pandas and the Minnesota Blizzard. And John Bartholomew just wins an absolutely clutch game. Uh, if you're just getting here, he keeps the Blizzard's hope alive in this position when his opponent, Zhao Jun, lost on time, unable to figure out how to deal with it. But to credit John, he defended a bad position and was actually better here in this final moment. Uh, right before Zhao Jun run out. So, Robert, I'm putting you in the coach mode. You know that Li Chao and Wang Yue are super tough on boards one and two. Yeah. But, but what do the Minnesota uh, Blizzard have to do? I think it's fair to say Tang and Bartholomew have to win, right? And yep. if they can, to even if they can and they get an upset from somewhere else, all they need is a tied match, right? A tied match sends the Blizzard to San Francisco because they have draw odds, everybody. They are the one seed from the Pacific Division. Yeah. So where are they going to get the points from, I think, is the essential question. And, well, Lee Chow against Fidel Corrales. With all due respect to Fidel Corrales, I'm not seeing a Blizzard win there. Wang Yue against Cristobal Enriquez. I'm not seeing a Blizzard win there. Zhao Jun against Andrew Tang. Now this is where it's getting interesting because I think neither player has had their best day. Of course, you can see that in the results. Right? Half a point for Zhao Jun, only one point for Andrew Tang. But it's really been the play. Like Something about their play has been off. They seemed a bit nervous. Uh, Andrew Tang blundered a full rook in the first game from what we thought was a good position. And we just saw Zhao Jun just have a very nervy battle against John Bartholomew. Yes, there might have been some connection issues, but that's not really what the issues he had were, is that he's not finding the precise knockout blows when he has a great position. So I think that is the critical matchup, and I do believe that the player that scores on that board, if there's a victor, that's which, whose team will win the match. Shout out to Vikon12 in the Twitch chat who says, I never knew how entertaining watching competitive chess was. Well, now you know. Thanks for being here if you happen to be tuning in from the homepage of Twitch. Give us a follow before you go anywhere else and make sure you mark down the Pro Chess League as uh, one of your one of your spots to watch every year here uh, because we've had a full schedule. We started back on January 8th. We are now on March 26th hosting the playoffs that you see before you. We've already been, been uh, pleased with an amazing match between the two teams from St. Louis with the Archbishops moving on from the Atlantic, and we're about to find out who's going to go to the championship from the Pacific. 
Uh, the uh, Archbishops won by a score of 9-7. to seven. And uh, without further ado, everybody, don't go anywhere. This is it. It all comes down to this match right now as the games in round four get started between the Pandas and the Blizzard. Here we go, Robert. Tang with White versus Zhao Jun. Back to his Bishop at four. That's the game. Right? That's the game that I've been... Uh kind of suggesting will be the decisive one in this match because both players struggling. If you're a Zhao Zhun, you just need to play solidly. You know that Andrew Tang is playing his little London system stuff. And so just equalize. That's all you got to aim for. You don't need to win this. You have to trust your heavyweights in the top two boards. Li Chao and Wang Yue are clearly tremendous favorites on those boards. They're just, they outrate them by collective like 300 points, if not more. Right. So you just have to trust your top boards to it's honestly maybe near 400 points just by how highly rated those players are. But trust them, just equalize, play solidly, and try to hold Andrew Tang here. And don't get into time trouble against Andrew Tang. Right. You just gave him like a list of seven things. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, right, right. I like almost had a monkey dancing on my forehead there. Um, well, we've seen you do that before. We don't want Darkness, that to my old friend. Um, the No, no, but of course you're totally right. And, and I think... I, it's fair for us to say that we need. Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> we need. We need uh, Tang and Bartholomew to get wins. If we're Blizzards fans, right? We're not really rooting for either, but um, that's what you have to get. And then you got to hope, as you said, you got to hope that your top two boards, Corrales and Henriquez, just don't lose. That's it. Uh, that's, that's always been the problem when I was predicting this match. We started off by saying, who do we think is going to win and why, right? I think John Bartholomew, I mean, he's playing great chess and he outrates Zhang Di, who is clearly very underrated, by the way. But he still outrates him by 500 points. He's an international master. I'm giving John Bartholomew the big nod on that board. I just don't see the top two boards going anything but Zhang Di's way. They're just so much stronger. Yep. And I would say the same thing if I was replacing... Fidel Corrales or Cristobal Enriquez, like those guys are just so good at chess. And obviously these are strong GMs for Minnesota, but it's not the same caliber. Right. And there's no offense when it just, by looking at the ratings, it's just, you know, the ratings are there for a reason. Well, uh, there, there is the man of the, uh, of the hour right now on the board. We have Grandmaster Andrew Tang versus Grandmaster Zhao Jun. Uh, Tang playing his London defense systems he knows he knows well, and if we're describing the X's and O's, as we've kind of described um, our predictions of the match, but this whole system with the London is built around extra control of the dark squares. You're bringing everybody to sort of overprotect an area of the board so that you you can use that as a launching pad to other things like a kingside attack. The queen comes to f3, the bishop comes to d3, the queen goes to h3, and Bob's your uncle on h7. This is what happens in Andrew Tang's dreams. Um... Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Of course, Black is going to try to challenge those dark squares with C5, but to sort of paint the picture of of uh, what both sides are battling for here, uh, this London, Tory, these kind of systems are built around over over control of a certain area so that you know that, that extra strength allows you to quickly jump to something else and, and to dictate the tactics on a, on a particular side of the board, especially if Andrew plays C3 here. To kind of, in fact, there he goes. He plays it right after I highlighted that. Which, and the whole point is to overprotect the dark squares, um, so that you can get an attack. And there you have it. That's why Zhao Jun's a strong player. He's not going to let that bishop, everybody, come to d3 and wreak havoc. Um, so okay, we have a game. We'll see what happens. But I think we've kind of set the tone for what the main theme is in this battle. Let's let's go check in here with the other game that just got underway. John Bartholomew versus Zhang Di, and we have a tart to cower, my old friend. Yeah, you somehow I feel like you've commented in so many Tart to Cower. What is the it's like the, a Tart to Cower curse? I don't even like the Tart to Cower, right? <laughs> it's such a mouthful to even say. A Tart to Cower. Say it yeah. five times Tart to Cower, Tart to Cower, Tart to Cower. I'm not going to. I'm just going to let you do it. Thanks. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I need some <laughs> water around good, here. Right? Beep. Good, good, oh, wow, that hurt my ears. Hey, I'm what tired. Was? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, Zhang Di has to be anything but tired because, you know, he should be tired of losing. That's what he needs to be because he's struggling. John Bartholomew is playing good chess. And, well, I guess, Danny, what I would say is for people wondering about this particular opening, yep. the problem you tend to face for Black is you really want to play C5. Yep. But you can't do that immediately because if you play a move like C5, 
you have to worry about your d5 pawn. So let's say in this current position, c5, dc5, bishop takes c3 check. Otherwise, you lose your d5 pawn. You really don't want to lose that one. Pawn takes, pawn takes c5. You're like, well, I've hurt white's pawn structure, but look, white is ahead in development, completely like c4, challenging these hanging pawns. And so I think, generally speaking, black is the one who gets left behind with a isolated pawn. Yep. And that clearly favors white in the ensuing likely middle game. And shout out to everybody that's with us here, all roughly 4,000 of you on the edge of your seat. Don't go anywhere. Go get your friends because this is, uh, this is the dramatic moment. We got our boy hanging out, DJ G Words. Uh, we know who you are, international master in the chess TV chat. That's our boy, Ted. Uh, that's my guy, Teddy. International Teddy, master David Pruis, the one, the only David Pruis, bringing you PCL pro chess lessons all the time and regular commentator. And the, uh, the Twitch chat, look at that. Armenia Eagles, Artok, go to bed, dude. Do you ever sleep? What do you mean? It's like 8 in the morning Oh, there. sorry, my bad. I lost my time zones there. You're totally fine. Yeah, 8-11. I just Googled Okay, it. there you go. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay, so um, got to be honest with you. Love Lee Chow's position. Do not like Fidel Corrales' position. I see a pawn storm happening in the near future for Lee Chow. Those pawns will go to E4, F4, and maybe even E5. Yeah. And I just... I'm just not a fan of these type of like Grunfeld structures where black is totally cramped and white fianchettos. And I think the fianchetto is honestly often the most challenging setup for black to deal with yep. because it's so solid. It puts your bishop on a great diagonal. And if you don't get any space, look at your bishop on c8. It's got nowhere good to go. Well, especially the fianchetto with the delay of, of the full center, because I think that, uh, you know, the basic idea of the Grunfeld, as everybody knows, is black is willing and, and and sacrificing a two-pawn center for white under the hopes that you'll take it. To be clear, in the Grunfeld, they want you to play e4 so they can take on c3 and then play c5. And what they have now are these targets for the rest of the game for all of their pieces to gang up on. So as Robert said, not only is the g3 line solid, but it's really the lack of, of playing e4 that I think from a practical point of view, Robert, is very difficult for Grunfeld players to handle because now... You've got a very solid structure for white, a solid king side. And again, notice I never played e4, so I never gave you that knight takes c3. I never gave you something to attack, but I'm going to play e4 once I've really kicked you back. And that's exactly what white's doing now as he builds up the big pawn center. Here we go, e4 and f4, right? So I think, I think, uh, and would you agree with this, from a practical point of view, the g3 system is also just irritating for Grunfeld players because it doesn't let them get what they want, which is they want you to have a big center so they can attack it. A hundred percent. And I think Fidel Corrales presented an E5, which is very obscure. And I saw Greg Shotty in the chat. That was something that I wanted to mention. The knight E5 move wasn't, is not really standard theory. And it allows white to do exactly what he's doing in the game. Yep. Because if you trade your knight away from F3, <laughs> now you can push your pawn to F4. So. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I, just love, I love watching, I love checking in on Lee Chow. I feel like he's just, like he's, he's playing a game that we're not playing right now. He is just... <laughs> I mean, he's just been drinking. You see the massive jug of tea he had at the beginning? I don't know what's it. They look like some kombucha, which I could go for right now. Um, he just, I mean, could, wait, what just happened here? <laughs> in, you know, in his game, why Why did this trade, all these trades happen? Okay, white's still better. Yeah, white is still better. But, but honestly, I mean, the reason he's better is that bishop on h8 is not very good. But I think like black is getting out of this pretty quickly. So if you go, where's your bishop going? Um, oh, sorry, I'm stretching here as Aaron does his best Lee Chow impersonation. I uh, love it. Oh Yeah, man. it's like, I honestly think that Fidel is going to hold this game. That's really huge news for the Blizzard. And the reason why I feel confident saying that is now he can actually play for h6 and try to play for g5. Because if your bishop goes to h, well, I wouldn't go to too early. But when, if h6 well, removes bishop h4, right, at some point I'm going to play g5 to break your pawn chain. Yep. Because after I go g5, you have to take me with your f pawn, in which case e5 falls. So I played bishop e6, uh, yeah, and then play. And I think e5. you should do it the way you're saying. I think you should play bishop e6 first, right? Simplify, get the light square bishops off the board. At some point, now that f7 isn't, in fact, he does it. Now that f7 isn't a target, your idea of g5 will come into play, right? Yeah, and I think that black is. I, I don't want to be too overcome because rook c to d1 looks actually yeah, quite annoying. And white the still owns the only open file on the board, which is. It's dicey. Yeah. Actually, because now G5, F takes G5. Your F7 pawn is hanging. 
when rook d7 comes and b7 is also hanging. Yep. Hmm. It's a tough moment here. And he played g5. That's the kind of natural move, if you will. But I also think it's a bit risky. And maybe he could have had a useful waiting move instead. I'm not sure he did. But I do see some of the downsides here. But bishop g5, rook e5. Hits the He's bishop lucky rook e5 comes with a tempo. Otherwise, rook d7 is almost lights out already. Yeah, now bishop f6 is one idea just to trade off those bishops. Oh, he there does it. Is. It. Yeah, I mean, white is going to be slightly better in all these endgames because your but rook I is in the that, open file. I think it is going to be a draw. And I think Lee Chow was looking out the window, actually considering the match situation, being like, oh, I guess the draw is okay. Uh, David Pruis in the Chess TV chat saying he thinks he was looking out the window and saying, ah, there's no way no way for Black to draw this. I'll just go for it. But I, I don't know. I think that Black is holding, and I, I think that maybe he was considering the match situation, kind of expecting his, his teammates to come through. And, you know, for Li Xiao, you hope he's right. Because, look, he's just, play, he's just playing this out to a draw right now. This is uh, – so the only I game we like haven't that. looked I mean, at, we'll come back to whether Finns is doing his job versus Zong D. Looks like an interesting kind of – Tang game is the crazy the Tang one. Tang game honestly. is the crazy one. We haven't even looked at Wang Yue's game, which I'm flashing flashing on the screen now. But let's go back to Tang's position because, wowzers, we have a knight on G6. Houston, the H-file is about to become open. Yeah, that's why he went rook f7 instead of taking on g6, which you cannot afford to take on g6. They're getting mated in just a couple moves yep. because after hg, hg, they open h-file. My queen comes to h5 yep. and goes to h8 with mate. So he went rook f7. The good news for black is besides your e6 pawn, you're very, very solid here. You're never going to really take on g6. So that knight should just sit there forever. Do not, do not take on e7. I, at least I wouldn't. I think that just allows black to say, okay, I'll take back with probably my queen and yes maybe you have your bishop and that might be good for white but i'm not in any danger at least from the checkmate perspective so i would leave that knight there as long as i possibly yep. can because black is well really so much so that it. i wonder if white shouldn't consider trying to trade the bishop on e7 and kind of uh bailing out and change the dynamic i mean how, how do you bring how do you bring more firepower into this attack if you're andrew tang here like what that's the question Right. I'd probably start my cast on queen side, put my king on b1, throw my rook from c1, maybe, oh, sorry, from d1 over to g1, play g4. I, I think you have some time to work with. I'm not saying it's, you know, the best position in the world or the easiest attack in the world, but I think if you take on e7, then at least black is in no immediate danger and can say I, 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 a couple precise moves and then I equalize. Whereas with a knight on g6, you're always scared of some kind of h6 pawn break where you would have to allow me to take on g7 next or to see your position open up. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very dynamic position. I think Tang is, you know, he really has to think here because, you're, as you said, Dan, I think you're right, that take on e7, if you don't see anything better, yeah. at least gives you the dynamic of having a, a good bishop against no bishop. And it's a very London system theme. All right, well, let's peek on this game that hasn't gotten any love yet from us. It was a King's Indian defense, also with a Fianchetto system to back up and take you through this journey real quick. We had a G3 King's Indian from Wang Yue. Wait, Danny, I'm really sorry to do this because we should pay attention to this game, but I think Fidel Krauss made a huge blunder. Oh, let's go back. No, if you see it, just yell, yell oh, at my... Oh, no. Did he just... He made this move pawn to A4, he... thinking that he was just getting one of these pawns off the queen side, trading off some pawns, but rook d4 was very oh timely response. Oh my gosh, response. and he's shaking his head because the king and pawn ending would be easily lost, everybody. If you trade on d4, you just walk white's king into a uh, into a very, very easily winning situation. The king and pawn ending dominated by white here with the much more active king. And he's just oh, shaking no. his head. Now, he still is going to have some drawing chances, but honestly... Not very much, because when this rook moves and he loses this pawn, he's now down He's now down a very clean h-pawn on this side of the board, and where's black's compensation? Uh, and there's still, it's because of rook endgame, there's still some chances, but white's king is already better, and the h-pawn can just start pushing at yep. will. That is, oh, I feel really bad. I mean, he looks very upset, and he needs to calm himself down. And look how much time he has left on his clock, Danny. Yep. He was playing. Yeah, you're right. It's just a horrible. I mean, this is... This is why you have to be careful. Even if you're playing and somebody has the demeanor, they're making the decisions that tell you, okay, he's okay with a draw. And so you think, okay, he's okay with a draw. I'm just going to keep getting a draw. And then you take for granted that just because someone's okay with a draw doesn't mean they won't punish a blunder. And when you play A4, Absolutely. that's a blunder, and he punishes you. And now you're just down a clean pawn and rook ending. Uh, now, now, you're, now you're lucky to draw this game. Yep, you're absolutely correct. And wow. that's, I mean, it's just... 
they needed that. They really needed this half point because if you look around, when they finally get to the game you want to pull up between Wang Yue and Cristobal Enriquez, I think that that game is one where Black isn't in any real danger of losing necessarily, but it's one of those positions where White is very comfortable and has various ideas like knight b5 to d4 or in the immediate position playing bishop h3 for Wang Yue saying, I'm going to try to take your pawn f5 and leave you with an isolated pawn on the king side there. So um, to me, with keeping in mind what's happening in Li Chao's game, if I'm Wang Yue, I'm looking, do I have another half point for my teammates? Yeah. Chung Yu needs two points out of these four games. You're getting one on board one now. It looks like that. Yep. This board's unclear. So then you, I think, how are the other two boards going? Do I have, if I make a draw here, will somebody else make a draw? Was, right. was because exactly, because even if Lee Chow wins and he makes a draw that gets them to eight, if they lose both of the bottom two boards, right? If Tang wins and Bartholomew wins, the Blizzard, and and for those of you who don't know, the Blizzard have already won won matches before in epic comeback fashion, right? In the uh, the second to last week of the of the Pro Chess League regular season, they came all the way back from a huge deficit in amazing fashion. So it has happened. Yeah. So you're saying there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance, right? Oh, and 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 uh, Harry, Harry, yo, wizard, I'm bringing the blizzard. Harry, I told I'm you. bringing the blizzard because I'm a I'm a wizard. I'm not gonna say yeah. something so I can stop. Anyway, yeah. No, I mean this. When you have a knight on G, something on g6, it means that when you play h6, black can't stop you from opening the position. That being said, if you do take on g7, my rook is perfectly placed to capture back. Yeah. So. If I am Zhao Jun here, I'm thinking, well, okay, I don't want you to take on e7. So maybe I play bishop d6 now, yeah. offering a trade of bishops. And like I said, hg7, rook g7, I'm always okay with that. I'm not thrilled about it, but I'm okay, especially because the knight's pinned to the queen. Yeah, and to point out again, everybody, of course, taking h6 is a no-no. Discovered double check with mate on g8. Taking on g6 would allow queen takes g6, and then h7 is coming where the king will have to lose the rook on f7 so that's that's andrew's idea and and the one thing that makes me feel confident for for tang in this position robert is even though i don't look at this position strategically and say that white has the best attacking chances i've ever seen in a, in a london system i know that tang has played these types of positions before i know he's played right. these types of positions in blitz and bullet uh this is not unfamiliar territory to him in terms of how to generate an attack even without that light square bishop if you give you give white that light square bishop back in this london and put black's light square bishop anywhere else and, and white is just crushing uh but even with that i i think he knows these positions so it means that the tactics he's come calculating he's probably familiar with absolutely and it's actually pretty difficult for black here because every single move that you can make you see a downside to it and that's a real problem to have because let's say I even make this with bishop d6. You're not throwing any take on g6 yet anyway, I don't think. And so, um, I mean, I could take on d6, bring my knight back to f4 if I want. Black's king side is never going to be safe, is my essential point. You'll always have to keep your eyes out over there on the king side. White eventually will castle queen side, try to bring that rook into the game as well. I'm not saying black is toast because I don't think that's be the case yeah. at all because I don't see a knockout blow, at least not in the imminent future. But I definitely think that white is the one holding all the cards here. Okay, well, we see further simplification in this game between Wang Yue and Henriquez, and I, I agree that this one looks more likely black will hold, of course, than the one, um, excuse me, between... Ooh, wait, is it just over, or did he just swindle a draw? Li Chao gave up the G4 pawn. Now, now this looks moments away from winning for white. Yeah. C7, C7. forces rook G8, I think. Oh. oh, no. Wait, 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 but your king's too far away, I think, right? So, uh, I don't know. Or is it? Oh, I can go king b6 here. That's a nice move. King b6? Okay, king... I, oh, I don't even have rook b4 check. You have rook b5. Ouch. Yeah, so I'm able to trade rooks because my h pawn Yeah, your is... h pawn is too right, strong. Right. These pawns are too far for, for Jimenez, I... for Corrales to catch. Yeah, I got scared for a second. You're right. I was like, oh my gosh, is he going to win the C pawn? Yeah. But I think even if you go rook f6, the king's too far away. So you probably are able to win that game as well. I actually think it's. Or do I win? Yeah, I win. So rook f6, king c7, h6 is. Or rook f7 check first, pardon yeah, me. Yeah, put me on the eighth rank and then h6. But I can go to e8. And then I go h7 anyway. Rook h8. Ah, uh, you have rook g7 just in time. 
Yeah, and there's beep boop. Check and queen. Check and get the new queen. So actually both rook takes f6 and king b6 are winning here, which, again, if you're Corrales, you got to just be feeling terrible right now. And that isn't like one of those like horrible things to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, I mean, you just got to be feeling terrible. You had this game easy draw. You played a4. Oh, heartbreaking. I guess it goes to show that it wasn't that easy, right? Because it was a very natural plan by Corrales. And he just, I guess, wasn't taking his opponent's plans into account. He was yep. moving way too quickly. You have still have eight minutes in your clock. There's no reason that you had to play so quickly in that end game. Game we haven't looked at much. Uh, the one between bat board fours here, the battle of board fours. Uh, Bartholomew versus Zongdi. Um, I guess I, I guess Bartholomew's position is still better, right? Despite the past C pawn, it's blockaded. A seven is under fire. Um, yep. But it's not so clear. I guess the main advantage you give Bartholomew is John isn't always up on time. But when, when he, he is, is but when he is, he's usually in good shape, right? I definitely agree with that. And the, but the problem I see with John's position here, well, it's not really a problem. It's about winning chances. Right? He needs to win this game. We agree yeah. on that. But when I look at this position, I can definitely envision a future where Black just takes one of the pawns, either the A pawn or the E pawn, probably the E pawn, and white gets both the A and the C pawn, and I'm down a pawn in an end game, but it, you know, rook end game, lots of drawing chances, even if I'm down a pawn. So that's the kind of thinking I'm having. And if I'm Zong D here, I'm trying to figure out, I'm probably going to lose some material at some point. What is the best way to play such that I have compensation as I made in the form of activity? I get my rook right. to B2. I try to get my knight to C5 to D3. I need to figure out some way to get my pieces further up the board. Otherwise, I'm just suffering, and my pe I'm actually getting suffocated. And unfortunately, speaking of suffering, as we go back to the uh, game between Li Chao and Corrales, indeed, the Chinese Super GM chose the line that we highlighted with Rook takes F6, and uh, Corrales is frustrated there. Shout out to uh, D Price. Thank you for the Tier 1 sub. We've had a lot of different subs, a lot of people showing their support. Sorry for all those that we aren't able to shout out during these big events like this. So much going on, but we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. Thank you oh, for being no. here, no matter where you are watching this from. Oh, man, that was a heartbreaker for Corrales. Uh, that's a half point they are going to desperately probably want back, but it's not over yet. Penguin GM is opening the king side, and uh, will it amount to something? We'll see. I feel terribly. You know, I never, I, I know Fidel, he's a friend of mine. You never want to see anybody suffer that kind of, you know, it's just a team event, right? If it's his own game, he loses his game, he can blame himself, whatever. But now it's, you feel just terrible for your teammates. And right now, it's seven and a half, five and a half. But remember, Minnesota has draw odds. They need two and a half out of three on the remaining boards. But I'm just looking around these boards. This game is very complicated. It can go either way. Tang is currently up a pawn. But that pawn on g7 is kind of a shield for the Black King. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can just snag that pawn with rook takes g7 at any moment. So maybe, I mean, probably now, rook takes g7, just play it. And, well, where's White's attack? And how is it going to continue? Yeah, they have to get two and a half out of, out of the three remaining games. And so this one is going to be crazy. Finns now knows he's in a must-win situation. John Bartholomew just playing the move rook to e4. Probably going to try to get really aggressive over here with that queen on the king side. Um, and again, the other game that, unfortunately, if you're a, a Blizzard fan, Black can only draw this game, and it may not be enough. Um, and I don't even know if he's going to draw this yeah. game. It's a very tough ending with all these weak pawns for Black. Yep. Look at this rook e4 move, classy move, swinging over to h4. And here, the question is, do I take on e5? The answer is definitely not because that helps Black's pawn structure. And now and the, this bishop will move to defend the pawn via the rook, but as you said, here comes rook h4 a position that White can sort of massage a victory out, right? I mean, um, poking at weaknesses on both sides of the board until Black collapses. Yeah. I still think, you know, Enriquez has decent drawing chances here, but what you want to do is Wang Yue is keep the game going as long as possible because at some point, wow, I was going to say something that just sounds really weird out of context. I was say <laughs> at some point Black might crack here because <laughs> – um, like, the position is just very hard to hold with all these weak squares. For example, the bishops get traded. Then my rook will go to d5 and try to go to b5 if you let me. So, yeah, it's... I don't like this position. Too many pawn islands. It's, uh, it's not good. Not good for sure. And that leaves... Well, he needs to hold this and hope that Penguin and JB win. So there's still chances, right? 
there's still chances for the Minnesota. Enriquez can only do what's in front of him. Yep. He needs to hold this draw. And well, Tang, I mean, Tang's game could go either way, but Tang is two minutes and 19 seconds. That continues to worry me. I know he's a great speed chess player, but what I do like about his position is the king safety element where he made this move pawn F4. Mm. Tang going all out. I mean, he needs to for his team. Yep. And the D5 pawn now is a target because if that E5 pawn moves, then of course, so Knight takes a four immediately going after the D5 pawn. He's going to try to castle long and, and uh, throw caution to the win here. The problem is he's also down on time right now. So he needs to get the king out of the center. Forget about the G pawn. You don't even care if it falls or the E pawn. You want to open up lines right now against the black king. Yep. You want to share the H5 square with your knight and your queen. So if this knight gets to H5, well, then it might even hop into F6. Yep. And it's not just about the immediate fork. It's just the weak squares in black's camp. Where are those weak squares? Well, D5 is one of them. It's already under attack. And F6 is another. And I see a very easy way to put a rook on F1 and try to get my knight into the game. So queen E5 played. I like that. smart. I mean, at this point, they can sort of draw draw their way to victory if their opponents aren't careful. So queen H3, spying with his little eye, a rook on C8. I expect yep. black will play rook E8, and probably Tang will castle long and just sacrifice the E pawn. Absolutely. He'll go castle long, and after queen takes E3. Oh, he plays knight H5 first. Is that... Oh, but that looks you, shaky to me. Yeah, but you can't take e3 because king f2 at the end wins the exchange. Got it. So barely it works. Yeah, I, I had the same reaction. Oh. That looked like a blunder, but Tang calculated but, it very quickly. Okay. But there's knight g5 here. That's a big problem for Tang. Knight g5 hits the queen on h3, and you can't protect the e3 pawn. So. Oh, no. Oh, and he finds it. The queen yeah, runs out of squares. Good. No, that's... And that might mean the Blizzard are running out of chances. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he should have played the more uh, simple approach, I guess, the one we first suggested. Castle long first just to get out of the center and then go back for an attack. Okay, black was probably still fine anyway, but that's your best best way to play it. Now you're going to have to lose the E3 pawn with check. And with it, yeah. the attack is going to get uh, get nasty. Um yeah, that's yeah. tough. You're going to be running your king to d1 and then uh, crossing your fingers. Yeah, actually, this is still really interesting. So queen e3, king d1, and you have knight f6 check idea, so yep. it's still clearly not over. But a move like rook g6 probably just covers the f6 square. Um, maybe rook f7 is safer because it covers h7 as well. Just an overprotect that square. And the knight on g5 is well defended by the queen on um, e3. Yeah, I mean, wow. white still is attacking. What happened? We just got a $100 donation for the show from Maypril. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Um, yeah, I agree with Dr. Dragonitsky as Naroditsky in the, the Twitch TV chat, saying lots of chances still for Tang. And yeah, this is this is going to be a tough conclusion here for, for Zhao Jun. We've seen connection issues from him. We've seen some struggles over the board as well. So Tang needs to get this attack going, get it going quickly, not just yep. over the board. But, but in he, terms he's of focused now, and he's zoned in. You can you can see a focus. You know a focus Tang when he's sighted in the wild. Shout out to Maypril's donation again uh, that came with a compliment. Great commentary. Have really enjoyed this and learned a lot, which is honestly like the best thing ever. Enjoying it is one thing, but learning a lot. I think Robert and I are... Uh, both teachers at heart, which is why he'll spend six hours, you know, doing U.S. Chess Championship commentary, hopefully finding instructive nuggets. And I think we're always trying to pull out interesting things people can apply to their games. So, Maypril, that means the world to us, and thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And as Danny said, it's, we're just trying to help people learn. Uh-oh. We may need to learn about how to deal with forks if we're in John Bartholomew's uh -oh. camp. I think he just blundered Knight C8. Oh, no. He played Rook oh, D6 no. instead of retreating the Rook. And knight c8 That's... is on the board, and white no. is losing material. Unless there's some tactic here, he saw. Does he? No, I don't. I don't see a justification for it. Why? I don't. There is one. What is it? That's. No, I think you play queen d4 and just kind of hope that your pawn gets to d7, and like you have rook g4 to attack g7. But it's no. There's no way this is good for white after queen d4, knight takes d6, e takes d6. Just. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Well, Tang thinks about where to put his king to maintain his 
last chances at an attack. John is going to have to find some way to make up for this blundered exchange sack. Um, I actually like Tang's position more and more with every move that's gone. Yeah, by. the more I, I look at it, the more I think he still has chances, and he and he's and he's on is is on the edge too. You can tell Tang was really focused there. This was the problem with Queen C7 as Rook C8 comes and the C pawn. Frankly, it might be harder to stop than the D pawn if you're not careful. Um, the good news is if we flash over quickly here to Wang Yue's game, it looks like Henriquez is, is holding with the active king. It, it feels like black is in good shape to get a draw if you're a Blizzard fan there. Um, and it's one of those positions as well, Danny, that black can actually win if white's not careful, right? Because yeah. you split the inside pawns. Yep. And so if st some of them start falling, that's not going to be good news. So Henriquez playing very good defense here. And now he's relying on his teammates, in particular John Bartholomew. Yep, and back to that game. John has uh, put the queen on e7, hoping for a rookie eight. Sack, sack, mate, as they say. That was my nickname in high school. And uh, <laughs> back rank would be would be a, a, a lucky way to end it. But, you know, don't jokes aside, don't, don't think those things are out of the question right now. There's a lot of nerves on the line. Uh, both players are under serious time pressure. Black about to go under a minute. Um... Oh, I didn't even realize that. And if that's the case, then I actually like John's chances a lot because there's a menacing pawn on the sixth rank. Yep. There are going to be some attacks in the F7, G7 squares that you'd be careful about. Um, you know, white can just go D7 next. So if you go make a move like Rook F to D8, white just goes D7. I think white wins the game immediately on the, on the spot. So Rook D8, he's going to try to gather the D pawn, which makes sense. And speaking of gathering, Zhao Jun is, he's on the assault. He's going to gather the G2 pawn. And I think just... Uh, Go to work on D2. So Tang has to have some tactics up his sleeve here or it's going to be over. Well, how are you going to take on G2? Take with a rook? I guess I have rook. Oh, no, knight no, at four. Just a fork, right? Yeah, I want to take with the rook. Well, no, rook. If you take with the rook, knight F2, at four, excuse me. I fork you. Knight at four. There's no fork on. There's nothing on D2. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. All right, and he's only got 17 oh, wait, seconds. Oh, my seconds. gosh. Just take on G2 with the queen. You force the queen trade. Okay, no, Queen E3. No, Tang that. survives with Queen D3, and Zhao Jun only has 14 seconds to figure. This is Tang's wheelhouse right oh, here, no. everybody. This kind of time pressure moment. Oh, this six, is Tang's five. wheelhouse right here. This is... Oh, gosh. He took on D2. I think that's a good move. Knight F6 check, King F7. There's Rook takes H7. There's Knight takes G4. There's Queen H6. There's craziness. This is a Knight takes E8 game. is probably Knight best. Oh, I don't even know. Rook H7, King F6, Queen H6 check. Hope that he blunders the checkmate. Rook G6, Queen F4 check. So you have to go. Oh, Rook King... G6, Queen F4. He's only got one second. Oh, oh my God. Queen F7 check's coming. Queen King F6 check, check is coming, check. and he's going to win. He's going to get a win. Time. He wins on time. Oh, oh my, my gosh, God. he does it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so clutch that for his team so right there. That was so clutch. That is so close. It's, we have to check out the other two games. We got to get that dual oh board. Oh my god! Let's up. get the other two games up. All right. We're first. We're back to John Bartholomew's game. Who is? I think John's better. I honestly think he's better here. Oh my gosh! Because it's not like Black can do anything with his rookie seven bishop b three combination. Play right. king f one. Bring your king right over to the yep, queen side. Just play king f one. There's there's no way to sack the exchange. White's always going to be winning in that. Or actually, wait. No, he he can. He can sack the exchange and play c two. Then, then rook e1. But then rook d8. And then rook c1. I'm going to be up a b pawn. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So it, it, it's probably decent drawing chances there for black, but... Decent, but you have to really know your end games, and you have no time on your Okay, clock. I was thinking that rook ending had more drawing chances than I did, than it does. And now John is going to try to calmly bring his king forward. He's going to meet f6 with something like f4. Wait, he's considering whether he can take f7 now? No, because c2 would be too strong, even with bishop takes g6. So, so this is this why, is crazy. Why is he not bringing his king over? Why Just bring your king and take that pawn. No, why bishop a4? He's trying to threaten rook e8. Okay, just king f3. Please bring your king over, John. Yeah, now you can it's play king f3 because there's no f pawn. The pawn's pinned to the king. So now you can get away with it. Play king f3, then king e3. Oh, he doesn't do it. Okay, he should have. Now, the, the, what he's do worried about, now. Robert, is if king of three, there's f6. He's worried about letting... I don't, I don't care about f6. King of three, f6, then I just take you on f6. And then rook takes, king e3. And, and then I move my king, exactly, e3. And in fact, your king can't move anymore. My king's running right to your c-pawn. <gasps> Henriquez is the only one who can win this endgame against oh Wong Oh, my Yue. God. Minnesota is Holy turning around right now. 
holy everything. So Bartholomew in time trouble too. Okay, Bartholomew's in time trouble too. We're going to stick right here. He's got to get aggressive and just bring the king to f3. Wait, black's just going to give up f7? He's got a trick. If rook takes f7, rook takes b3. Okay, rook f7, rook b3. That is very true. So king f3. Put your king on f3. He's got to bring okay. the king over. He must see something we don't that he doesn't like. But he's got to no, go I think for he it. Just... No, this is the wrong way to go. This is definitely the wrong way to go here. Now he knows it. Now he's got to back up. Rook e8 check! He blocked Rook e8 check rookie and it's winning! Oh, he missed it! They both missed Rookie it! Rook e8 check was winning on the spot! Oh my god, they're both oh missing everything here. Oh my gosh! Here. The nerves are so real. Rook e8 check was the match! Oh my gosh, and you see Corrales above Bartholomew freaking out! Oh my gosh, yeah. That was the moment there. That was it! That was, that was Minnesota winning the match if he finds Rook e8. Just, uh But you know what? We, what? If Enriquez wins, all he needs is a draw. That's a big if, though. It's, oh, okay, and John Bartholomew, oh, he didn't trade the rooks there. I thought that uh, Zhang Di would trade these rooks off. And... No, but... What's going on in this game? I mean, I have no idea. I don't know which game to watch. Me neither. Let's I pull think up they're... both. I don't know where to go. <laughs> I'm freaking out right now. JB might even try to mate the king on f6 with rook c7, rook f7 mate. That would be, I mean, not hilarious for Chengdu, but he went rook to g5. Okay, so he's just trying to hold the draw there. How is the other game going? That king I, I on think d2 that John is does. So I wonder if John knows he might be able to take a draw. Cause... Wait a second. Enrique should play bishop e8 and king c3, king b. I, I don't know about the timing there, but it looks very nice for Enriquez if he plays him like bishop e8. Just like slow play this end game here, and he's yeah. going to. Bishop yeah, because the bishop on b3 has no squares. <gasps> John won g6, but he's giving up g4. He could lose and now. And Zongi offered a draw. Who did? And John, John is John going to take it? He took it. Okay, so that's at least one it. game it's left. all down to this game. If Enriquez wins this, he is a hero of epic proportions. Like, oh my god, John is going to be so frustrated that he had it with rookie 8. Like, that was game, if, game over. If he won that game, then the match... Oh, my God, A3 looks like a terrible move. Because now when I go King C3... Yeah, like if John won that game with Rookie 8, the match is over right now. And the Blizzard complete the most amazing comeback ever. Because cause at least Henriquez can't lose this position. The right. question is, can he I win? It's now 7-8, to eight, the Pandas lead. Right. And what can <gasps> White... A5! I think he needed to do that. He needs Bishop to get space. His Bishop's going to E8. Where did going to win the H pawn? Oh, oh wow, no. what a creative defensive resource there by Wang Yue. But that's this is why Bishop E4 was you need to keep that bishop on the other diagonal. And I think that was a huge miss by Enriquez. He should have kept his bishop on C6. Uh -huh. And I think he was winning. I honestly think that he was winning technically. It wasn't going to be easy, but I think he had it. Now Bishop D1. Bishop but, D1 holds, and he still can't lose, but he has to win. Yeah, that's the problem here. He has to win everything. I still can't is on believe John here. missed rookie eight. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. So here, bishop g four. Okay, but now he's eight. got he's got king c three coming. Yeah, king c three, so and then or bishop e two is also an option. Trying to win the c pawn, right? Like you go bishop e two. What does white do? I guess you have to go bishop d seven or e eight. Bishop d seven. I win c four. Like, I can win c4, you win f5, and whose pawn's moving more quickly? I like, I mean, black's king is perfect. No, this is scary for white. Really scary here. And, I mean, right now you see, okay, so. The if you question take c4, is, can you I trade c4 for h5? At this point, you have no, to go for can't. that line. You can't. I think you just lose. Because that you, you can't stop white's h pawn. Yeah, so that's not an option. So, you have to sit tight. You can trade f5 for c4, though. No, he's not going to. So let's see. King c3, king e3. Your king can't make any more progress from white's point of view. But you... No, you can't go for that. You can't even try to walk your king around. It's getting closer oh. and closer to a draw. <gasps> oh, oh, no, he's lost. Is... Yeah, I mean, how do you stop the h-bomb? He had no choice, he though. He did it for his team. He, he did it for his team. So There's no way he would ever do this in a real game, but... That's going to be yeah. it. 
Yeah, bishop takes f5 or is h5, honestly. I mean, h5, h6, h7 is... <sighs> wow. That's, that's heartbreaking. That's really... Uh... Absolutely nuts. Wait. Yeah. No. The queen with check. It's queen, queen with check, check. It's over. Man, well, you can just tell by how much quieter we've gotten. What's amazing is yeah. if John wins that game with rookie eight, then then he takes a draw here. Yep. Because Un Tang pulled off a miracle. Believable. Tang pulled off a miracle. Oof. Unbelievable. Back in this moment here, just to show everybody the the final shot was right here. A blunder by Zong D and Bartholomew with only six seconds left, unable to find the move rookie eight check, which would have been yeah. winning on the spot. And John's shaking his head yeah, there. Yeah, super frustrating. But just, you know, obviously that kind of time pressure, it's, you know, not perfect chess by anybody, but the Blizzards are uh, champions. They had an amazing season. Um wow. They uh they really did. They they well they they were champions of the regular season of the Pacific. That wasn't just me saying the cliche we're all winners here. We know we aren't all winners here. That's part of the competition. It's very tough and heartbreaking in these moments. But the Minnesota Blizzard did win the Pacific Division uh in the regular season. So and that was those were the guys that really helped get them there, but unfortunately today in the highest of dramatic possible fashions uh, the Pandas barely, barely beat the Blizzard. And uh, one game, one move would have had a different result, likely, and sent Minnesota to their first live final. But as it is, Shangdu joins St. Louis because they were both there last year. They will both be back. What a, an absolutely crazy finish there, right? Because it looked like it could have gone either way. We thought throughout that Shangdu was the heavy favorite, and they were. Yep. But Minnesota proved very tough. They were a great opponent. They're a great champion of their division in the regular season. And unfortunately, we saw them slip up in that final round. Fidel Corrales had a draw. I wouldn't say totally in the bag, but he was as close to a maybe a theoretical draw as you could get in a position like that. He unfortunately slipped up just by having a lot of time on the clock. On the flip side, Zhao Jun did not have time. He flagged for at least the second time today. So Shangdu suffered a setback there. And of course, we saw those last two games go Shangdu's way, where John Bartholomew missed a win. And then, unfortunately, Enrique is going all out because he needed to win for the team. He couldn't find the right path forward, and he goes down in what would have been a draw. But props to him for playing for the team there. And, well, he lost just because he, was, he had to win. Yeah. To show that one more time for the uh, instructive aspect of it for those who uh, maybe just didn't understand why it's so easily winning. But, again, this whole endgame has been centered around the strength of the D7 pawn and whether White can convert something on it. Um, and, and frankly, maybe maybe there were early opportunities as Robert was highlighting to go get the pawn. But John was doing his best to keep his eye on the C8 square while trying to go for that. And even though he didn't play in the most forcing way, it actually happened because of a blunder right here by Zong D. And the reason this move wins, again, black cannot take because the bishop defends E8, which would mean white gets a new queen with check, and it's just over. White Now white's just up a queen and, and, and just completely winning. Um... But even moving the king would not save the day because rook takes d8. And black is unable to win this bishop and protect the d-pawn from queening at the same time. So uh, black takes the bishop and, and white can even do a renegade rook, give up the rook with check just to make sure you get a queen uh, with a tempo and, and go on to win the game. So obviously these moments and many more are going to be covered here uh, briefly as we send things over to Levy Rosman and the post-match highlights show at twitch.tv slash pro chess league. So don't go anywhere. Stick with us. Let's raid Levy and bring him the noise and the funk and uh, all the hype that was probably the most dramatic, most exciting pro chess league coverage you and I have ever done, Robert. I mean, okay, not true. The finals last year. Zavin yeah, Andras, but, but, but I mean, this has been literally nail biting stuff. You couldn't fake this drama. Uh, wow. Yeah, and we have to uh, tip our caps to Minnesota, bid them a farewell on a great season. And yep. it hurts, honestly, to say that. But, Danny, you're right. It was fantastic. We couldn't have asked for a better match. We couldn't have asked for better competitors within the match. So, you know, it was fun for the fans. Absolutely. And, uh, again, everybody, go with us. Let's, uh, let's go see what Levy and his crew have got cooked up over at the Pro Chess League channel for the highlights. 
for the entire team here, for our producer, are in Hawaii, behind the glass, as we like to say. Um, my partner here, Grandmaster Robert Hess. Um, if I could just reach over there and squeeze you and hug you, I would, but I can't because it's magic. Um, hey, Danny. Danny, you did a great job today. Thank you, sir. And for the entire for the entire Pro Chess League team, tune in on April 2nd. That is when we will have the battle between the Central and Eastern Division champions to this point and figure out who's going to round out the Final Four in San Francisco on May 4th and 5th. So for all of us here at Chess.com, go watch Levy at twitch.tv slash Pro Chess League, and we will see you on April 2nd.